This video contains spoilers for HiveSwap Act 2 and HiveSwap FriendSim. If you have not yet played these games and would like to enjoy them spoiler free, please click away. Additionally, this video is intended for viewers over the age of 13. On the screen, I am showing some content warnings that apply to the entire duration of the video. Since this video is so long, it has been broken up into sections and each section has its own additional content warnings if applicable. Timestamps for skipping sections can be found in the description. So, on November 25th, High Swap Act 2 was released. And it's kind of been out for a hot minute now. We waited three years for this game. But it wasn't three years without content. Between Acts 1 and 2, we got Hive Swap Friend Sim. Do you remember Hive Swap Friend Sim? Because I sure do. It's just about all I've drawn or thought about for the last two and a half years. And I'm here to make you think about it just a little bit more, too. Yes, I know that you read the title and you're here for the Jade Car rewrite, but Hold your horses for a second because I need to supply a little bit of context before I get too deep into anything. My favorite part of High Swap Friend Sim was the Jade Bloods. They are a dysfunctional family who is bound together through their misery of being forced into becoming nuns. Though we never get to see them interact directly much, as Friend Sim was much more about individual characters, there was a pretty clear image of this group that was being communicated. Though they were not so excited about being stuck with each other, they did genuinely care about each other when all is said and done. And then Hive Swap Act 2 happened. And I know I sounded a bit pessimistic there, but... I have to say, overall, I really enjoyed this game. The art and animation were absolutely phenomenal. I could go on a whole tangent about how much I love the visual development and art direction in these games, and honestly any grievances I do have with areas outside the Jade Car are incredibly minor. In fact, I was going to have a section about my issues with the rest of the game, but anything I thought of was really nitpicky, and as fun as it could be to nitpick, that's not what I'm here to do, for the most part. You all read the title, and you came here for the Jade Bloods, and the Jade Bloods I will deliver. I'm going to be talking about the Jade Teal Car only, for the sake of keeping this video a somewhat manageable length. The rewrite I am making is intended to be able to fit into the story as a replacement and not massively impact any of the events that become before or afterwards. And now, before I get in too deep, I also want to make a few disclaimers. To start, this is my first time ever making a YouTube video, so if I make any rookie mistakes, please forgive me. I am open to feedback or advice on how I could improve my videos in the future. And secondly, I am not a professional writer. The things I create are subject to my own strengths, weaknesses, tastes, and biases. What I am making today is not something I want to advertise as being objectively better or made of a higher level skill than anything from HiveSwap, and I am not intending for this video for any of the criticism I give to come off as personal attacks towards people who like this game or people who worked on this game. It's merely my thoughts on the finished product and what didn't do it for me and my own take on the story and how I would have written it in a way that I find more compelling, more interesting, things like that. And I probably will be pronouncing some of the trolls' names differently than you do. Sorry, I'm not going to change that. And I am aware that people have different outlooks on these characters, and as long as your interpretations are based in good faith, I take no issue with this fact. Especially if Act 2 is your first exposure to the Jade Bloods, I can totally understand having a completely different interpretation of how these characters are than if your first exposure was through Friend Sim. So, what's up with the Act 2 Jade Bloods anyways? I am aware that Friendsim was not intended to be a definitive portrayal of these characters, and from what I can guess, and I must emphasize that this and all other things I say about the production of these games is an educated guess, about the production process is that Act 2's outline had been written before Friendsim was started. Act 2 and Friendsim did share a few writers, however I want to stress that deducing the identity of who wrote this segment is not my goal nor should it be anybody else's because it's honestly counterproductive. From my understanding, each troll started with a basic summary of characterization that was used to make out Act 2's outline and determine what each character's general role would be in the story. 
And then, when production on Act 2 was stalled, these summaries were given to the Frensim writers, who fleshed them out into a fully rounded character. In the end, basically, the characters had to be reverse engineered a bit to fit back into the roles that had been determined for them in Hive Swap Act 2. Frensim was a little bit like a pilot episode for each of the trolls. The purpose of a pilot episode is to take characters and ideas for a test flight, to find what works and what doesn't, and then the plane comes back into the workshop, has adjustments made, and the next try can be even better thanks to those adjustments. Sometimes characters go hardly changed from pilot episodes to the final series, and sometimes they change drastically. None of this is new or unexpected to anybody, I think. Friendsim and Act 2 having differences in characters is something I anticipated, and I want to make it clear that my issue is not with the characters being different, but with the characters being different in a way that's not interesting or compelling. And now I know that some people are probably thinking they're minor characters, so why do they need to be super deep and interesting? Why do you care so much? And well, first of all, I will let you know I have never cared about anything substantial ever in my entire life, but my own questionable tastes aside, I think that is a fair point. No piece of media is obligated to linger on and fully delve into every single character it introduces in a story that has any number of background characters that would probably grind any plot to a screeching halt. In fact, unfortunately, my own rewrite is focusing much more on the Jade Bloods than the Teal Bloods. There are 13 characters in this sequence, the Five Jades, the Five Teals, Joey, Zephros, and Marvis. It is really hard to juggle that many characters into a relatively short story that still gives them each enough focus to feel fleshed out. I think that also doing a rewrite of Teal's and Jade's car to be more centric on the Teal Bloods and their relationships could be really fun and interesting. And I really like these two groups of characters and having to put one aside to favor the other pained me immensely. But unfortunately, a Teal Bloods rewrite is not the ballroom I'm dancing in today. So, the Jade Bloods. One of the unique aspects to the Jade Bloods compared to the other blood casts of trolls and why I think they are so interesting and deserving of complex characterization is that they're presented as a unit. While many of the other trolls know each other, the Jade Blood stories are quite deeply interwoven. They live together and have known each other their entire lives, and the relationships that emerge from this kind of experience are deep, layered, and incredibly tantalizing. That's why I love them so much. And from the amount of focus that the Jade Bloods get in Frenzim, as well as the amount of world building there was about the brooding caverns, it's a very fair assumption that if they're not protagonists, they are at least going to be a step above many of the other trolls in Act 2 in terms of the screen time they will be given. They are set up to be important characters that the audience is supposed to care about. And in a way, this foreshadowing did come true. The trial segment is the longest part of Act 2. It took me three hours to play it the first time I tried. And it's almost entirely about the Jade Bloods and their interpersonal drama. And that is exactly why they need well-rounded characterization. When characters are interesting and well-written, reading 10,000 words of nothing but their personalities bouncing off of each other is entertaining. It's very, very hard to care about characters if there's no substance to them. I wouldn't have minded spending three hours in the Jade Teal car if I'd been reading about interesting versions of these characters, even if they weren't exactly the way I pictured them in my head. So what's my problem with the characterization? The way the Jade Bloods are portrayed in Act 2 feels like a version of them that came seven turns later in Broken Telephone after Hive Swap friends him. In essence, Yes, these are mostly recognizable as the same characters. Branya is the mom friend, Lanera is the strict substitute teacher, Daria is the angsty rebel, Lonk is a condescending asshole, and Wanchi is a naive kid. From an objective standpoint, having the characters be different is not a bad thing. The issue is that these are very hollowed out, boring versions of the Jade Bloods. The changes were not made in the interest of better, more nuanced characters. Wanchi and Daria changed the most from Frenzim to Act 2, and personally, I think Act 2 did both of them the least justice. If I can be incredibly mean about how the Jade Bloods were written in Act 2 for a second, Branya does nothing and exists for the plot to happen to her. Daria and Lonk are interchangeable, and there is almost no difference between them. 
Wanshi is 11 and therefore relegated to the plot device with no personality. Elenara is the only character with any kind of true depth, but none of her depth matters because nobody cares about her. And I think that the likability of these characters failed overall because of Lanera, who is the only one of the group with a real attempt at depth. The other Jadebloods really hate her, but the narrative doesn't try and explain why besides saying she's annoying. Yes, Daria insists that Lanera is trying to get them thrown off the train, but Lanera never makes any serious enough attempts at harming anybody to feel deserving of this type of scorn. And at no point do any characters suffer consequences for showing her this scorn. And since she's the only character with depth, a logical choice would be to make her the sympathetic one, but she isn't. When the, playing the ending where she is convicted, I honestly thought it was the story's true and good ending because all the other characters were so happy to see her go. Overall, the characterization just really confuses me. I can't tell which of them I'm supposed to like and sympathize with, and they all feel too shallow or too horrible to like. Which I think is a shame. When you're making art, one of the most important things is intention. If the audience can't tell what you were intending to do, you probably need to go back and rework a few things. The dislikability of these characters stems from one single issue. The true, deeper aspects of their characterization has been stripped away. The reason that these characters act the way they do, we aren't shown or told anything like that. The trial is about Daria, but do we learn anything about them other than their basic character summary? Throughout the whole segment, the Jadebloods do very little except for act catty and mean to each other for no good reason and then have romantic drama slapped on afterwards as a motivation. And since Wanshi, who is 11, has no place in this conflict, she's barely a character at all. This is not interesting. Shallow, petty bickering is not what I want to spend three hours reading. I will spend three hours reading petty bickering if we get real character insights from it. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna be mean again, this is just a whole lot of nothing. It's like empty calories reading this. There's no point to any of it. So what would I do to turn this shallow petty squabbling into nuanced petty squabbling? I'm so glad you asked. The changes I am making in my rewrite will be almost entirely character driven. After all, I don't think the story aspect of the sequence is lacking. I actually really love the mock child Ace Attorney parody. It's so silly and so fitting for the situation and it perfectly sets up a reason for all of these characters to be bickering about something in the first place. The basic story beats will remain largely unchanged, but the dialogue, characterization, and character motivations will be given an overhaul. In the end, all of this will very much still be recognizable as the same story. Think of it as fixing a few malfunctioning parts and giving it a shiny new coat of paint. Another thing I want to try and replicate is Hive Swap's nature as an interactive game. I don't have the ability to actually make a game that you can play, but I'm going to try my best to take into account what this would hypothetically be like if you were playing it. I don't have the time to sit here and come up with new dialogue for every individual com combination of giving trolls each of the items in your inventory since this document is already 44 pages long with just the bare bones of the plot outline. I don't want to make it any longer than it has to be. But I'm going to be writing multiple endings for the story, and I will be building on the Frenzim characterizations for my rewrite, with some of my own interpretations and headcanons thrown in for extra zest. But don't worry, there will still be quadrant drama, moral bankruptcy, and petty squabbling because such is the bread and butter of Homestuck, and characters without conflicts are boring. Basic characterization time. Branya is the all-loving, motherly leader of the cloister. Though she is kind, she is highly secretive and suppresses emotions more than any of the other Jadebloods. Lanera is the stringent, neurotic second-in-command. She is wildly insecure, eccentric, and capricious, and much so an acquired taste both as a friend and as a character. Wanchi is the naive and sweet but slightly spunky youngest of the group. She doesn't like to be babied or coddled, and she is quite smart and knows more than she lets on. But in the end, she is still just a little kid. Daria is the cranky, angsty middle child of the Jade Bloods. They are closer in age to Wanchi than the others and thus get along with her the best. Daria can be combative, but they are usually the one finishing fights, not starting them. And yeah, I'm using they pronouns for Daria. It's my rewrite, I get to pick the pronouns. If you don't like it, you can go and watch somebody else's Jade Car rewrite, I guess. Blanc was always kind of boring, so I am going to change him slightly. He still acts pretty much the same as the Lank you know and love, or know and hate. 
He's condescending, suave, and full of himself, but he has character motivations and a backstory now, like characters are supposed to. I won't spoil them, though. You'll have to find out when we get into it, I guess. So at the end, I will be discussing more in depth my thought process behind the characterizations and why I made the decisions I did. I am saving it for the end because some of the deeper aspects of these characters' uh, personalities will go into spoiler territory and I would like to not spoil the story that I am telling until after I have already told it. So I want each of the Jade Bloods to get enough focus that they can feel like a truly fleshed out character. Each of them has their own ending to the trial, and I'm not going to spoil who the culprit is in this rewrite either. Ooh, it might be the same person, or it might not be. You'll just have to keep watching and find out. Additionally, I want to give players a reason to do each of the individual endings before moving on to the next car. Aside from trying to make each one unique and interesting, I'm not going to give away all the information about these characters in a single route. The full picture of their relationships and personalities will be understandable only with all of the endings under your belt. And I want these characters to be so engaging and likable that you want to play all of the endings and learn everything about them. Hopefully I succeed at this. I've mentioned my goals a bit in passing, but I want to make it very simple and clear what my goals and rules are for this rewrite. I want to create an alternate telling of the Jade Teal car that can fit into Hive Swap Act 2 without changing anything major from the parts before or afterwards, or changing anything about Joey and Zephros' characterization. I want to stay faithful to the original Jade Teal car. The basic story concept and story beats will remain intact, and the story's nature as a playable game will also be taken into account and accommodated for. It should be recognizable as a reinterpretation of the same story. I want to give the Jade Bloods more compelling characterization and motives. I was pretty blunt with this already, so I think you get the idea. And I want to make something that is interesting and have fun doing it. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't love Hive Swap and the Jade Bloods, and I want that to be evident in the work I create. So, now, let's get into it. Part 1. Preamble Joey and Zephros enter the Jade Teal car, having just talked briefly about the concept of quadrants. Joey is like, you know, I think I'm ready for a break from quadrant drama. Then she opens the door. Silly Joey, this is Homestuck. There is no escape from quadrant drama. As usual, the Jade Bloods are bickering. Well, mostly it's Lunk and Lanera bickering, with Daria occasionally interjecting at either of them. Branya is begging them to settle down, and Wanshi is reading from her book, intent on not getting involved but still figuring out everything that happens anyways. From this setup, you can kind of glean that Lonk and Lanera got started on an argument about 20 minutes ago and are unable to call it quits. Joey and Zephros kind of walk through the whole car, doing that whole hand-next-to-face line-of-sight blocking gesture when Wanshi eyes them curiously over the top of her book. None of them make an attempt to stop Joey and Zephros from simply heading to the next car, though, and the player won't really be able to interact with any of them just yet. So, attempting to continue onto the next car is what Joey and Zephros try. The door coincidentally flings open right as Joey reaches for it, and wouldn't you know, it's Marvis. Isn't it cool to see him again? The only minor change I am making is that Marvis is not wearing his hat and will not be seen with his hat until the clown car, and this change will make sense later, just keep it in mind for now. Marvis engages in some good-natured banter with Joey, while Zephros fidgets nervously. He is amused to see her again, as always, but Joey stops talking because she knows that everyone in the car has gone completely silent, and they're all kind of staring at Joey for having the gall to talk to a clown out of nowhere. Lanara and Lonk have been whispering under their breath this entire time, and at this point they are they have made their way up to whisper shouting, and literally everybody in the car can hear them, so they're kind of becoming the center of attention. Marvis, in his good-natured but also over-familiar and intimidating way, ambles over to the Jades and lazily asks what's going on over here, do they need an ospitice or something? Both Lanara and Lonk sputter indignantly at this, and Daria snorts without breaking deadpan, and Wanshi stifles a giggle into her book. Rania is about to speak when she is cut off by Stelsa, who has wiggled her way between Marvis and the other Jades. She denounces the petty squabbling as Jades being Jades, and there is nothing truly remarkable about it. Tarona then emerges from the train car's bathroom. She's holding up some crumpled pieces of paper, and begins to ask if they belong to anyone, but she trails off in surprise at what has happened in her brief absence. 
Before anyone else can react to Tarona, Marvis beckons her over and asks to see the papers. He reads from them aloud, eliciting a mixed bag of disgust, amusement, and embarrassment from the other trolls in the car. Joey is kind of like, well, I only understood like a third of the words you just said, but judging on how everyone else reacted, it was really dirty, right? Zephros, whose face was deep burgundy, will respond, honestly, I've read worse. And Daria rolls their eyes and is like, so that's where those pages went. Lanera says, wait, those are the missing pages from the sacred text, and she glares daggers at Daria, who merely shrugs defensively in response. The mention of sacred text piques Marvis's attention. He inquires to Branya, asking first if she is the leader. She cautiously nods, confirming. Marvis asks if Branya has the rest of this important religious what's it and if he can see it. Branya hesitates, but then hands over the ripped up book. Marvis innocently asks the question that set off this time bomb in the first place. Who did this? Wanchi quietly whispers, oh no, as Lang, Clanera, and Daria all try to say at once what has transpired, and Branya simply rubs at her temples, exhausted. Marvis listens to the three of them bickering for a few moments, and then raises his hand to ask for silence. He says, well, I think the answer is pretty clear, you hear me? He gestures to Stelsa and the other teal bloods. Stelsa has her hands clasped together, and her eyes dart to the side nervously. Then, cautiously, she asks, it is? Marvis laughs and gives Stelsa a friendly whack between the shoulders that dislodges her glasses. Marvis then says, we've got a civil dispute and a car full of teal bloods. Stelsa catches his drift and says, yes, and now we have a high blood to stand in for his honorable tyranny. Tazius interjects into the conversation. At first she states that, like in the original, she would rather gouge her eyes out than get involved in this. But if they must, she suggests, nervously but with just barely concealed excitement, that they could use it as a test run for a new conceptual legal system she's been working on. All of the teal buds groan at this because Tazius has been pestering them about it for ages now. But Marvis wants to be a good sport and hears Tazius out. Tazius explains her idea for a legal system in which everyone is innocent until proven guilty. And Joey is like, wait, isn't that just how law works? And the other trolls give her a curious look, and Zephyrus loudly says, well, you know us resties, we don't know shit about anything, while shushing Joey. Stelsa continues, though, saying it's a marvelous idea, and you can never practice too much for your cruelest bar exam, after all. Even if we must play along with Tizeus' completely nonsensical and purely hypothetical thought experiments. There was a bit of back and forth bickering with the Jade Bloods again when Marvis turns to them for their answer. Branya does not want the Teals to get involved, and Lanera is insistent that she can discipline the other Jades just fine. She and Lonk have the I'm the whip, is everyone else hearing this exchange, because yeah, I will throw the original a bone, that was a really funny joke, and I don't want to delete it. Marvis plops himself down in his seat between the Teals and the Jades. He tells Tazius to explain further. Tizius says that they will be holding a trial under the concept of defensive legislaceration, in which Daria, the accused party, will be innocent until proven guilty. Daria deadpan interjects, you know, I already offered to jump off this moving train if it'll make you all shut up. Tizius presses that no, Daria should be entitled to due process, and Daria is like, okay, but sticking a fork in an electrical socket is also a due process. Joey and Zephros are trying to sneak through when Stelsa calls out to them like, hey, where do you think you're going? Marvis is like, yeah, why are you bailing on us, Joe? Joey says, well, it looks like you guys got this all sorted. And Tizia says, not so fast. We have a prosecution legislacerator, but we need a neutral third party to be the defense legislacerator. Someone like you and Zephros. Joey is like, you want me to be a lawyer? The only thing I know about law is the Jurassic Park mock trial I did in 8th grade. I'm barely in high school. And Tizius is completely unfazed by this because she only understood like half the words Joey just said. She's like, sorry, them's the brakes. Marvis assures Joey that she'll do a great job, and he can guarantee her safe passage through the next cars if they cooperate. Stelsa offers to be the prosecution because she agrees with Lanera that Daria did it. Joey says, hey, aren't the lawyers supposed to be unbiased? And Tizius is like, Stelsa, I think you're missing the point of this thought exercise. Lanera accuses Stelsa of eavesdropping, and Long says it was kind of hard not to since Lanera has no inside voice. Tizius chuckles, saying that that's something Lanera and Stelsa have in common. Tizius is like, all right, well, then that's settled. Let's begin the preparations for the trial. However, this time around, nobody knows that Marvis is planning on hauling the guilty party off to Clown Town. Ooh, there's a change in stakes for you. Jade Car Part 2, Rising Action. So Tizius instructs the player that before they can begin the trial, Joey needs to know exactly who and what she's dealing with. The player can now question the other trolls in the car and interact with them more deeply. 
The player can talk to Branya and ask her about Daria, about the book, and about the cloisters. If you ask Branya about Daria, she will simply let out an exasperated sigh. She says that Daria is her ward, though they would never willingly offer up that information themselves, and a particularly difficult case among the Jade Bloods. Branya will clarify, though, that there is no material proof that Daria defaced the book and only circumstantial evidence. She refuses to directly say if she thinks Daria did it or not. If Zephros asks what they're doing outside the caverns, Branya will say that it's the heiress's will and even she doesn't understand it. If you ask about the book, Branya will explain the basic timeline thus far. First of all, the book never should have been taken out of the caverns at all, but somehow, somebody managed to steal it, and there's nothing they can really do about it now. The thief who stole the book must have defaced it and ditched the torn out pages in the load gaper where Tarona found them. They all became alerted to this mess not long into the train ride when Daria got up to get a snack from their locker. They opened the door and the book came tumbling out. Everybody witnessed the book falling out of Daria's locker, which made them the immediate suspect for the crime. Lonk didn't believe it was Daria who did it, though, and he and Lanera have been arguing about it all evening. Branya notes that it's strange for Lonk to be coming to Daria's defense, since the two normally can hardly hold a conversation without going for each other's throats. It seems as if Branya genuinely doesn't know what to make of this crime. The player can talk to Lanera and ask her to give a statement, ask her about the other jades and why she cares so much. Lanera's statement will be that she had nothing to do with the crime and is also 110% sure it was Daria because Daria is a vagabond and a truant and a degenerate with a long history of being destructive and disrespectful towards everything and everybody in the brooding caverns. The book is an important religious relic and full of blasphemy and the Jade Bloods are charged with protecting it so of course Daria would want to steal it, read it, and deface it just to spite her and Branya. If asked about the other Jades, Lanera will express frustration that all of them are so flippant towards their calling. She's already said her piece on Daria, but she says Lonk and Wanchi are similarly disrespectful, if in different ways. Lonk flaunts his breaking of the Jade Blood codes like a medal of honor, and Wanchi is smart, but she never tries hard enough and wastes all her time reading silly children's books. Joey will point out that Wanchi is a kid, but Lanera says that she is also a Jade Blood and she has a job to do just like the rest of them. And if asked why she cares so much, Lanera will be incredulous. She says that the Jade Blood's calling is the most noble of all the callings in the troll world. Their job is incredibly important and the rest of these lowlifes don't know how lucky they are to have been born into it. Everything must be done in a particular way to avoid anarchy. The order and organization of the Brooding Caverns is of the utmost importance and anything that threatens it has to be destroyed. She is clearly talking about Daria with the last bit. The player can attempt to talk to Daria, but doing so will result in them telling you to fuck off if you know what's good for you. The player can also talk to Wanshi and say how little she is, ask about rainbow emotions, and about the other jade bloods. Joey will remark to Zephros that Wanshi is so little. Zephros doesn't understand what Joey means due to the nature of trolls being individualist. Wanshi overhears them and huffily pipes up that she has all three stripes, so lay off her, alright? Joey, who is confused, will ask if that means she's not with the other jade bloods. Wanshi will tell Joey that she's awfully strange and then giggle. Joey's strangeness is endearing and fascinating to Wanshi, not irritating, unlike every other troll Joey has met. Wanshi then sighs and says, yeah, she's with the other Jade Bloods, but she wishes they would all just quiet down. Their arguing makes it really hard for her to concentrate on her book. She laments about how she's only been able to read about half a page the whole trip because she keeps accidentally eavesdropping and then having to start over. If Joey asks about rainbow emotions, Wanshi will say that she doesn't quite know exactly what it is. She says that it, she sort of remembers Lanera teaching her about some important book, but Lanera's lectures are also boring and long-winded. Joey asks if the book Wanshi's reading right now is a rainbow emotions book. Wanshi, seeing an opportunity to info dump, gets incredibly excited and explains, no, this is Soldier Purbeast, the best book about feral cats having petty drama in the woods ever written. She says a lot about it, and neither Joey nor Zephros absorb much of it at all. If Joey asks Wanshi about the other Jade Bloods, Wanshi will say that she honestly has no idea who defaced the book, but she had nothing to do with it, if that's what Joey's asking. Wanshi admits that Daria feels like an unlikely, but not impossible, pick for the culprit. Daria does have a knack for destroying stuff when they're in a sour mood, but they hate reading, and when they're mad, they just grab and break whatever's closest to them, so the chances of them bringing along this book specifically to rip it up feels a bit contrived. And they seem to be in a somewhat good mood tonight before all this happened. Well, as good a mood as Daria can be in, anyways. Even-tempered, not snarling or hissing at anyone, and certainly not a throwing chairs and smashing vases and ripping up books mood. Wanshi ponders this for a moment and then whispers to Joey that she thinks Lonk did it. He loves getting under Branya's skin. The only problem is, he loves bad vampire books, so in her naivete, Wanshi can't imagine him wanting to deface one. But she then quickly adds, You didn't hear that from me. 
The player can talk to Lung and ask him what he thinks of the situation, what he thinks about the other Jade Bloods, and whether or not he's excited for Jeevik Week. Lunk will agree to be questioned if you make it quick. Lunk says that the situation was entertaining at first, but now it's become tiresome and exhausting because arguing with Lanera is only fun for so long. He says that he doesn't actually care if Daria is innocent or not, it's just funny to piss off Lanera. If Joey asks what Lunk thinks of the other Jade Bloods, he will say they're all annoying and he can't really stand any of them, and that Lanera especially is a pain in the ass who could really stand to get paled. Joey will respond that that's not what she meant. She asks Lunk who he thinks committed the crime. He shrugs and says that all of the Jades are suspect. Lanera would do anything to get Daria out of the cloisters. Daria has a regular habit of breaking shit when they throw temper tantrums. Once she's definitely dumb enough to mess something up this bad, and branya has been awfully quiet except for trying to get everyone to shut up. If Joey asks Lunk if he's excited for Jeevik Week, he will snap that he's not here to make idle chit-chat. After the player has finished questioning the Jade Bloods, they can move over and question the Teal Bloods. The section is much shorter because I didn't change them much from the original. If they're not broken, I don't want to fix them. So Tagiri will not give a statement because he insists he is above the petty drama of hysterical... I can't fucking read that word. I'm gonna put it on the screen. I can't read it. Stelsa is adamant about going along with the trial as she does not want to disobey Marvis' wishes, though she is a bit apprehensive about Tizius' ideas of judicial law. When Joey asks about her and Tizius, she adamantly denies that they could be vacillating. Most of the implications of this go over Joey's head. She just assumes they're really good friends. Tarona is very nervous about the trial. She promises that if she had ripped out those pages, she never would have returned them. She then goes on to spout about how excited she is about going into the field of historical revisionism. It's her one true passion, to know things that nobody else does. Tagora is in just a fantastic mood for the trial. He says to Joey, you know, I myself happen to be quite suspicious in this situation. Joey and Zephrosa are understandably weirded out about this. Tagora goes on to explain he's a teal blood who loves rainbow drinkers and happens to have a lot to gain monetarily from stealing the book, since it is such a rare tome that normally cannot be accessed by anybody outside the cloisters. Joey asks him why he's telling her all of this. He then tells her to go get the security tape and he makes them all watch it and it's just as awful and stupid as it was in the original, but it was really funny so I'm keeping it in. And talking to Tizius will give the player direction on how to proceed and begin the trial. When the player asks Tizius about defensive legislaceration, she will explain the difference between the current Alternian system of presumed guilt and her idea where a trial is an intellectual battle about undercovering the truth. If Joey asks about Stelsa, Tazius will smile wryly. She says that Stelsa is a formidable debate opponent, even if she's not a legislacerator. Joey notes that Stelsa and Tazius's verbal sparring has a much different tone to it than Lonk and Lanera's, but she can't quite articulate how. Joey asks Tazius what she's supposed to do. Tazius says the plan of attack is simple. Get statements, evidence, a timeline, and then use it to mop the floor with Stelsa. Stelsa says that Tazius will be eating her own words within the hour, and Joey can't quite grasp the vibes between them. And after having taken statements from every troll in the car, the player can then get the key from Branya to collect evidence. The evidence that can be collected is an article of clothing from Daria's bag bearing Lonk's symbol, an open bag of snack mix from Daria's locker, a soldier per beast's book from Wanchi's bag, Branya's itinerary, Lonk's makeup bag, a twisted hairpin found in Lanera's locker, ripped out book pages that Tarona found in the bathroom, Lanera's boy band magazine, and Branya's Marvis merch? Joey tucks this one away into her pocket for safekeeping. And with the evidence collected, statements taken, and timeline assembled, the trial is ready to begin. Jade Car Part 3 Trial Stelsa begins the trial by giving her opening statement. She is haughty and a little bit smug about it, presenting that Daria is irrefutably the culprit because the book was in their locker. She considers this case open and closed. Joey's opening statement is a bit shaky. She's not quite sure of herself yet, and her defense of Daria isn't the strongest, especially since Daria was stubbornly refusing to cooperate every step of the way. Joey tries to call Daria as her first witness. Tazia stops her and says it's a bad idea. Daria should not testify. Daria snaps that they can speak for themselves and then says that they don't want to say anything. Tazius is like, that's exactly what I just said, and Daria is like, yeah, but I wanted to say it myself. Tazius grumbles and rubs at her forehead, this is going to be a long trial. Lanera laughs triumphantly, Daria has no defense and is therefore guilty. Tazius' patience is already running thin, she again explains to Lanera that she must prove Daria is guilty if she wants there to be any kind of punishment. Figuring this is a good place to start the discussion, Joey asks Stelsa what her evidence is that incriminates Daria. 
Stella so laughs and repeats, the book was in Daria's locker. Joey nervously rebukes that the book being in Daria's locker doesn't automatically make them guilty. Stelsa, already presuming her victory, asks, oh, and how so? Joey panics, but Tizius gestures for her to keep going. Joey says that she wants to call a witness to the stand. The first witness is very important, it's going to set the tone for the whole trial. Since the Teal Bloods are more accustomed to this sort of thing, she decides to call a Teal Blood first, and who better to pick than the one who discovered the pages? Tarona is shocked and panicked that she would be summoned to testify. She says that she doesn't want to give a statement because she doesn't want to be cold. Joey tries to calm her down, promising that no one's gonna get hurt. Tarona then hesitantly agrees to answer questions. Stelsa isn't fond of the idea of Tarona being questioned, insisting that Tarona had nothing to do with the crime and therefore has no valuable information to offer. Joey says that everyone in the car is technically a suspect since everybody here was present when the crime was committed. Selstar rolls her eyes. Joey asks Tarona what happened when she went to the bathroom. Tarona angrily responds, that's none of your business, and Joey's like, no, I mean, with the pages, how did you find them? Tarona nervously explains that she was washing her hands when the train went over a bump and all the pages fell down from the top of the cabinet. Joey contemplates this for a moment. She's hesitant to trust Tarona since her whole job is like historical revisionism, but what she said has given Joey an idea but she's going to need more evidence to make a watertight argument. She can't rely on Tarona's testimony alone. To try to get an idea of who to talk to next, Joey needs to ask Tarona some more questions about what she did when she got on the train. If the player presents the boy band magazine here, Tarona will embarrassingly admit that she had been following the Jades around at the train station because Lonk looks like Actius, her favorite performer from Hatch to Dance. Tarona, Daria, and Wanchi boarded the car first, but Daria had almost immediately gone to another car to get a snack, insisting that the best snack mix always sells out fast, leaving the two of them alone. Wanchi had waved to Tarona and said that she noticed her following the jades around. Tarona was flustered and hesitant to talk to Wanchi at first, since surface trolls find unprovoked kindness to be unnerving. However, Wanchi, in her wonderfully oblivious and friendly way, got up and sat down next to Tarona on the teal side of the car. Tarona said that Wanchi had asked her so many questions about living on the surface that eventually she started asking Wanchi questions too, mostly about Lunk. However, Tarona had been fascinated to hear other things about the cloisters, such as the fact that many of the Jade Bloods share respite blocks. In fact, Wanchi's blockmate is the primary suspect. Lonk interjects that, yeah, they're mine too, and Lanera's square footage is kind of a hot commodity in the Jade Hive. Joey tries to picture the four of them sharing a bedroom and cringes at how horrendous that must be. Tarona, trying to keep her cool since Lonk is watching, says that she had been distracted by talking to Wanshi until it was time for the train to depart. Tarona then sputters that she has no more knowledge about the events of this evening, but if she had to make a guess, Wanshi probably knows Daria the best. So, Joey decides to question Wanchi next at Tarona's suggestion. Joey questions Wanchi about sharing a bedroom with the other three trolls. Wanchi says that Daria is her favorite of her blockmates because they're the quietest, except for when they get mad, then they throw stuff and it's kind of scary. Stelsa interrupts and goes, aha, Daria breaks things when they're angry. Guilty. Tizius throws back at her that the mere act of having broken something doesn't prove someone's guilty. Stelso snapped a TRX ban before, maybe Tizius should call her the culprit. Lanera pipes up and says, it's true, Daria will throw chairs and smash plates and rip up books when they're mad. Joey asks Daria if this is true. Daria doesn't answer directly, but snaps, I could always break your fronds instead at Lanera. Lanera yells truant and Marvis loudly bangs his staff on the floor of the car for order. Branya asks Lanera to please not interrupt Wanchi until she's done testifying. Lanera crosses her arms grumpily, but obliges. Joey asks if Wanchi can provide an alibi for Daria. Wanchi says that she and Daria were travel buddies, and on the way to the train station, they both stopped and got distracted by a worm on the sidewalk for three and a half minutes. Then Lonk bumped into them because he was texting and not watching where he was going, and he got heated at Daria over it. The two of them were arguing loudly until Branya told them to stop fighting because they're going to miss the train. Joey tells Wanchi that that's not an alibi. Wanchi insists that she would never hurt a book. And this is true, presenting Wanchi's Soldier Purby's book will show that they are all in good condition save for normal wear and tear. It's clear that she cares about her books, which would make her facing one for no reason a very out-of-character move for her. 
Joey thanks Wanchi for her testimony and dismisses her from the stand for now. It's some information, but it happened way before the crime, so it's not exactly useful information. They need someone who's got different priorities regarding tonight's events. Joey decides it would be a smart idea to get testimony from the leader of the caverns. Branya tentatively agrees to be questioned and takes the stand. Joey asks Branya if it is true that Daria has a habit for breaking things when angry. Branya states that it's a bit more complicated than that, but yes, this is information that she, a neutral party who is not accusing anyone of anything, can confirm. Joey presses on, asking more complicated how. Branya simply states that Daria has some strange mannerisms that she can't fully explain. The questioning goes on like this, with Branya not being very cooperative. No matter how much Joey pries, Branya only gives short answers saying that she doesn't know anything and she wasn't involved. Joey finds this behavior strange. She thought Branya would be the easy one to work with since she seemed the nicest of the Jade Bloods, but at least Daria was making it clear that they wanted nothing to do with this. So deciding to take a more direct angle, Joey asks whether Branya has any evidence that can absolve or incriminate Daria. Branya adamantly states that she does not. Joey asks, you don't what? Branya will say that she does not have any evidence. Joey will respond, none, like, at all? And Bronnie insists, no, she saw nothing and heard nothing suspicious until the book was discovered. She was not involved and has never been involved in any conflicts at all. Lonk will interrupt, digging into Branya and saying she's full of shit. Branya will not address his accusation, but instead chides him for his language. She then turns back to Joey and says that Daria is her ward. If Daria had done something wrong, Branya would already know about it. Then, she realizes she accidentally took a side and she attempts to backtrack, but Daria butts in, angrily telling Branya that she had promised not to tell anyone. Joey contemplates this for a second. She then excuses Branya and calls Daria to the stand. Daria groans and protests, but Branya flashes them a stern look, and they finally agree to answer questions. Joey asks Daria what they think about the book. Daria responds that the book is dumb and stupid and boring. Pressing a bit harder, Joey asks what Daria knows about the book aside from their personal opinions on it. Had they seen it before it was in their locker? Daria turns this question over in their head for a moment and then says, yeah, I'd seen it once. Someone stuffed it in my bag at the train station. Again, Linera springs up, declaring guilt. Daria snaps back at Linera that the book had already been defaced when they first saw it. And then Joey is like, wait, you knew the book had been defaced before the train left and you didn't tell anyone? That kind of like entirely changes our timeline. Daria defensively spits that they don't even know what's so great about this book anyways, it just looks like more of Lang's bad vampire erotica. They assumed it was some garbage he wrote, so they had returned it to him, which means he must have been the one who stashed it in their locker. If they'd known that they could have avoided this much bullshit, they would have just given the book to Branya and told her it was Lang. Everyone in the car looks at Lonk quietly. He's clearly annoyed at Daria for accusing him after he defended them earlier, but he doesn't lose his cool. He calmly says they should be looking at Lanera, who has been awfully vocal about trying to convict Daria and has a known habit of going through people's stuff. If someone planted the book on Daria, it must have been Lanera. He also points out that, just like Daria, having been in possession of the defaced book doesn't necessarily mean he had ripped it up. Stelsa deflects that Lanera has no logical motive and is far too straight-laced, and isn't even a likely suspect. Daria and Lonk are the two main suspects, they might even be conspirators. However, Tizius is watching Joey, and she can tell that the gears are turning in Joey's head. She encourages Joey to push forward. Joey argues to Stelsa that Daria is purposely being framed. Stelsa asks how Joey can prove that since it's a quite a bold claim. First, Joey says that there are more people who believe that Daria isn't the culprit. Branya, Lunk, and Wanchi all know Daria fairly well and have admitted that they think Daria is an unlikely pick, and Lanera seems to care more about punishing Daria than finding out who actually defaced the book, which would suggest that she has a personal vendetta against Daria. Additionally, it seems unlikely that Daria would only ditch part of the evidence, but leave the book itself in their locker. The fact that the book tumbled out from opening the locker implies that it was shoved in there hastily by someone not wishing to be caught rooting around in someone else's locker. If Daria were hiding the book in their own locker, they probably wouldn't have been so careless since there's nothing suspicious about a troll digging around in their own locker. Then, Joey asks Daria to get up and go to the gaper, and Daria rolls their eyes but obliges. Joey says that, according to Tarona, the pages had been stashed on top 
of the cabinet above the sink. However, even in their boots, Daria, who is currently stretching their arms up at Joey's request, isn't nearly tall enough to reach up there. Stelsa suggests that Daria could have climbed on the sink, but Joey points out that the porcelain on the sink is pristine, as she had noted in her investigation. Anybody climbing on it would have left scuff marks, especially Daria's huge boots. Whoever stashed the pages in the bathroom and planted the book on Daria needs to have been tall enough to reach the cabinet without assistance. That rules out Daria, Wanshi, and Tarona as suspects. Stills again says that this is a bold claim and Joey has no material evidence to support it. However, Joey can now present the twisted hairpin found in Lanera's locker. Lanera goes bright green in the face. Long points out that Lanera does have a habit of going through other people's stuff because she's a nosy bitch. He's seen her pulling hairs out of Branya's comb and picking the lock on Wanshi's diary. However, Joey does not immediately go after Lanera with this evidence because Long's testimony may not fully be truthful. She simply states that this pin looks like it could be used to pick locks. Though it is suspicious it was found in Lanera's locker, that doesn't prove Lanera is guilty. But it does prove or at least strongly imply that someone was breaking into lockers and planting evidence on people. The culprit could just have likely have planted this evidence on Lanera to frame her as well. So with all of this said, Stelsa asks Joey, have you proven anything at this point? Joey, who is becoming frustrated with the lack of forward momentum, says, well, I guess I sort of proved Daria was framed, and we found out the book wasn't even defaced on the train, but all I did was make our pool of suspects way wider. We don't even know if the person planting evidence is the same person who defaced the book, which means we might have to catch two people, not just one. Joey pulls at her hair in frustration, and Tizius takes a sip from her mug and says, isn't finding the truth wonderful? And Joey says, no, it's kind of tedious and frustrating. Since it has been quite a while and the investigation has made some progress but not fully gone anywhere yet, the court decides to take a recess. This is where the large divergence in the path of the trial begins. During the recess, the order in which the player talks to trolls and what objects you show them will lead to you making an important discovery. The nature of this discovery determines the back half of the trial and which ending the player will get. Each ending has been given a title, as naming them after who is focused on or convicted in each route would be spoilers. This brings us to ending number one, Dance Dance Execution. During the recess, Joey can ask Branya if anyone inspected the book closer after it was confiscated from Daria. Branya admits that no, nobody had closely examined the book for clues since Lanera had considered it coming out of Daria's locker to be all the evidence that was needed. Joey asks if she can see the book to inspect it closer for clues. Branya initially refuses until Joey promises to inspect it right in front of Branya and give it back to her as soon as she's done. Joey looks over the book, gently flipping through the remaining pages and giving it a light shake to see if anything falls out. This search yields nothing until Zephros points out that there's a weird bump on the inside cover of the book. Joey finds out that there is, in fact, a well-hidden hole in the edge of the leather where something flat could hypothetically be slipped into a secret pocket. Zephros tries to use his psychics but apologizes to Joey that he can't get a good hold on the item in there without risking damaging the book. Joey takes out the loosest med kit she stole from Damick's house and wedges the scalpel in the hole to dislodge the item. Lanera notices Joey holding a sharp object in the book and goes ballistic, ripping the book away from her. However, what has been done cannot be undone, and a small, flat, rectangular object is sticking out of the book now. Lanera pulls it out, and her eyes go wide in shock and fury. It is a holographic bookmark featuring several cartoon purbeasts. Lanera rounds on Wanchi, holding the bookmark up in Wanchi's face. She asks Wanchi just what, pray tell, is one of your gaudy, useless trinkets doing hidden in this important religious artifact. Wanchi, at first not acknowledging Lanera's anger, gets excited and takes the bookmark from her. She exclaims that it's her favorite one and she's been looking for it in her bag the whole train ride. Lanera snaps harshly at Wanchi to listen to her for once, for God's sake. What is her bookmark doing in this important religious book? Wanchi innocently asks, what important religious book? Furious, Lanera shouts at Wanshi, the Rainbow Emotions book, the most sacred blasphemous text to the Jade Cloisters, the one that was stolen and defaced that we've been arguing about all evening. If you actually put in the effort and paid attention for once in your life, you'd know that already. Wanshi responds meekly, the excitement typically in her voice gone, that she didn't know the book was that book. She thought it was just one of Monk's bad vampire books. Lanera yells at her again, How could you not know that Rainbow Emotions is our sacred text? I spent two days of lessons explaining this book's history and its significance to you. You are so smart and have so much potential, it is infuriating that you waste all of your time on those stupid, useless Wiggler's tomes. I ought to burn them all just so you can do better, Wanshi. Wanshi is starting to tear up and sniffle. 
She responds, I'm sorry, Lanera. It's just so hard to pay attention and sit still in your lessons. I swear, I've been trying my hardest, but I just can't remember. I'm sorry. I didn't know that it was an important book. If I had known it was that important, I never would have brought it on the train. Lanera shouts loud enough for everyone in the car to hear, So you're the thief who stole the book? Wanchi is full-on crying now, sputtering apologies between her sobs. Lanera is about to tear into Wanchi again, but Branya stops her, firmly putting herself between the two of them. She tells Lanera to back off. She has gotten her point across, and Wanchi doesn't need to be shouted at anymore. Lanera doesn't want to go against Branya's wishes. Her tone switches to submissive, and she tries to reason with Branya that Wanchi's bad behavior can't go unpunished. She can't just do whatever she wants with no consequences. Branya tells Lanera to take another look at Wanchi, and Lanera does, then gets another eyeful of Wanchi crying, rocking back and forth a bit, and wiping her eyes and nose on her sweater sleeve. Lonk is sitting next to her and patting her on the back gently. Even Daria looks a little uncomfortable with how thoroughly Wanchi has been verbally flayed by Lanera. Then Brun tells Lanera, don't you think she's been punished enough already? You thoroughly humiliated her in front of everybody else in the car. Lanera stammers that she's doing this in the interest of the cloisters, to make Wanchi a better jade blood. But the wind's been taken out of her sails, and she's starting to shrink under the judgmental stares of Lonk and Branya. Branya tells Lanera that mentoring other jade bloods is a difficult task. Glancing at Daria, she adds on, nobody knows that more than her. But Wanchi isn't an object that Lanera can mold to her will. She's a living troll with feelings, just like you, Lanera. Lanera frustratedly exclaims that Wanchi is not just like her. Lanera insists that she spent sweeps getting all of her mentoring and teaching tactics down to an exact science, a repeatable, reliable formula that's worked flawlessly for every other jade she's ever taught. The stability and repetition has brought her confidence and comfort, but trying to mentor Wanchi has been like... Well, trying to herd purr beasts. Nothing that Lanera has learned from sweeps of studying other trolls and how they behave seems to apply to Wanshi. There must be something wrong with her. Wanshi, who is still crying, asks Lanera, Is that how you really feel? You think there's something wrong with me? Wanshi's shaky voice threatens Lanera's resolve, and she looks Wanshi over again. Lonk is still sitting next to her and comforting her, and he's glaring daggers at Lanera. Lanera is overcome with guilt and sympathy, finally seeing Wanchi for what she is, a little kid. Lanera tells Wanchi that she never wanted to hurt her. Wanchi responds by asking her, then why would she say such hurtful things? Lanera doesn't have an answer for her. The silence is broken by Marvis's slow clapping. He says, would you look at that? No trial even needed and we found the guilty party. Lanera says bitterly to Marvis, yes, thank you. We can deal with this, waving him away dismissively. Marvis puts his hand on Lanera's shoulder, gripping it tightly. Lanera goes rigid with fear. He gestures to Wanchi with his staff. We have a guilty party. I say it's time for a trip to Clown Town. Lanera looks back at Wanchi, who stares at her with huge, sorrowful eyes. Lanera takes a deep breath, centering herself, and then firmly tells Marvis, No. The entire car gasps. Marvis isn't used to hearing no. He asks Lanera what she means. Lanera says quietly, but with unbreakable conviction. You heard Branya. She's been punished enough. Marvis sneers at Lanera. Once she is guilty, she has to accept her fate. Lonk stands up from the bench and stands next to Lanera, the two of them forming a wall between Marvis and Wanchi. Lanera looks over at Lonk, shocked. He's never sided with her on anything before. She's about to open her mouth, but Lonk tells her to save the chit-chat for later. Lonk, with his dramatic flair, tells Marvis that if he wants Wanchi, he'll have to throw both of them off this train. Marvis then says, very well. If it's a fight you want, then it's a fight you've got. Everyone except for Lonk and Marvis are a bit confused as to what's happening, but it's clear that something's about to go down. This situation then triggers a Strife minigame. The Strife is a Dance Dance Revolution-inspired rhythm game. The player must hit keys in time with the music to defeat Marvis in combat. The player controls Lonk and Lanera. Accurately hitting notes will yield synchronized dance moves, while messing up will cause the two of them to fall all over each other. Lonk is absolutely in his element and killing it, striking lots of dramatic poses, as is Marvis, but Lanera just looks a bit confused and weirded out, but she's getting the job done. The game has dialogue, however, due to its nature, it's much more gameplay-focused than story-focused, and it's relatively short. The general gist is that Lanera asks Lonk what is the purpose of the specific style of combat. Lonk tells Lanera to shut up, stay in sync, and see what happens. The player getting a high enough combo will result in Lanera and Lonk performing a frame motif and completely curb-stomping Marvis. This technique normally requires emotional synchronization, but physical synchronization can work as a substitute. When the game is completed successfully, Marvis will have vanished from the car, retreated back to the clown car to nurse his defeat. 
Lenara asks Lonk what the hell that attack was, and Lonk simply smirks and says, You really ought to read more of the cloister's forbidden literature. Lenara remembers the reason for the fight as Wanchi runs up to Lonk and hugs him, and he earnestly returns her hug. When the two let go, Wanchi sees that Lenara is watching her anxiously. Still hurt by what Lenara said, Wanchi refuses to meet her eyes. So Lenara sits down on the bench next to Wanchi and inhales sharply. She says, Wanchi, seeing you be put in harm's way made me realize how much you mean to me, but you shouldn't have to be in mortal peril for me to treat you with dignity. Wanchi sniffs, fidgeting nervously, still not wanting to look at Lenara. So Lenara continues, I was frustrated with my own shortcomings as a mentor, and I took those frustrations out on you. It wasn't fair of me. I'm sorry, Wanchi. Wanchi meekly asks if Lenara thinks there's something wrong with her. Lenara bites her lip. She says that Wanchi is different, but that doesn't mean there's something wrong with her. Lenara doesn't exactly know how to cope with those differences, but today has made it clear that trying to bend Wanchi to her will wasn't the right or fair thing to do. Lenara looks at Lonk, Branya, and Daria as well, and adds that they're all a little bit different from the other Jades, and maybe that's why the five of them stick together so much. But no matter what the Jade Code says, Lenara admits that maybe it's wrong to act like being different is a bad thing. Daria and Lonk both roll their eyes at this overly cheesy spiel. Lanara nervously says to Lonk that she appreciates his help in defeating Marvis. Lonk scoffs, saying he did it all for Wanchi, and if Lanara tells anyone that they dance together, he'll mix her shampoo with glue for the next three sweeps. He is silent for a moment longer, but then quickly adds, but it was nice to cooperate instead of fighting for once. Wanchi pulls the two of them into a group hug. Branya is also watching contentedly from the background, glad that Lanara and Long finally found something to bond over. The player gets a screen showing Wanchi hugging Long and Lanara that says, The End, instead of Game Over. Ending number two, New Scars, Old Wounds. The player can present Lonk with the twisted hairpin during the recess. He will refuse to comment on it, but following this, you can present the hairpin to Lanera and ask her specifically why Lonk isn't commenting on it. She will say that the hairpin is Branya's, but Branya didn't bring any hairpins on this particular trip. Joey asks how Lanera knows this, and Lanera admits to having gone through Branya's bag and not found any. Wanchi will see the player and Lanara talking about the twisted pin, and she will say that Lonk uses that kind as well. She's seen them attached to his suit pocket before. Zephros adds in that they did take Lonk's makeup bag, but they never actually looked in it. Joey unzips the bag, and inside there is a small plastic container holding several of the exact same hairpin that was found twisted up in Lanara's locker. Lanara seems genuinely shocked by this turn of events. She is about to start going at it with Long again, but Tizius gets between them and says, let's save it for the trial, why don't we? The trial goes back into session with Joey ready to go on the offensive against Long. She presents the court with the hairpins found in Long's backpack. He scoffs and says, Branya wears the same kind of hairpin as me. It could be her just as much as it could have been me. Lanara retorts that Branya didn't bring any hairpins on this trip, and Long tells Lanara that it must hurt having Branya's boob that far down her throat, and Lanara growls at him angrily, flexing her claws. Branya tells the two of them to stop fighting and pleads with Long to just tell the truth. Long laughs coldly, saying Branya has a lot of fucking nerve, insisting that someone else be truthful. Lanara butts in again and asks Long what his fucking problem is, because Branya hasn't done anything except for ask him to be a little more civil. Lonk again tells Lanara to shut up and stop trying to fight Branya's battles for her. Lanara exasperatedly argues back that Branya has no battles here, all Lonk's doing is being petulant and difficult and deflecting the blame off of himself. Lonk says that there's no blame to be had, Daria put the book in his bag and he gave it back to them, neither of them defaced it. Joey says that if Lonk didn't deface it, that would make the only two viable suspects Lanara and Branya, since neither Wanchi nor Daria are tall enough to ditch the evidence, which she and Stelsa can both agree on is a hard sell. They're still hoping that the person who ditched the evidence is the same person who defaced the book so they don't have to catch two culprits. Plunk scoffs and says that it wouldn't be such a hard sell if either of them even knew Branya at all. He says it is honestly kind of stupidly obvious that Branya ripped the book up. Like, use your brains guys, she's been quiet all trial. Only people with something to hide are that quiet. Branya finally acknowledges Long's accusations. She has nothing to hide. She is the matron, and Long has no right to question her will, she says as she gives him an uncharacteristically dangerous glance. Long snarls back that the other jade bloods might be her mindless sheep, but he'll never bow to her. Branya says that the jade bloods are not her mindless sheep. She values each and every one of them, and they are all near and dear to her pusher. 
Long says that he's surprised Branya has room in her pusher for everyone. After all, he knows it shriveled up a long time ago. It beats nothing but lies and hypocrisy into her blood tunnels. Lanera and Wanchi both come to Branya's defense. Neither of them can really understand what Lonk is trying to say about Branya. Daria has remained decidedly neutral. Lonk didn't expect them to understand. They don't know anything about Branya. None of them do, not the way he does. Tysius asks him if he's ever going to explain what he means or if he's just going to keep spouting Moreau's poetry for the rest of the train ride. He tells Tysius that she's not the Legis Lacerator here, so stay out of it. Branya asks Lonk if the book is really what this is all about. Meanwhile, Stelza is trying to have this discussion overturned, but Marvis is showing interest in it, particularly towards Lonk himself. Marvis asks Lonk why he is so interested in proving Branya's guilt based on nothing but a hunch. Lonk says that Branya is nothing but a lying, backstabbing bitch, and the fact that nobody else is believing him despite Branya making no attempts to defend herself is proof that he's right about it. Darius snarkily asks him what's got his pantaloons in a twist, did Branya throw away his bong again or something? Lonk smooths down his hair, his movements rigid and carefully controlled. Marvis asks Daria why they're getting snippy with Long since he was defending them earlier. Joey interjects that yeah, the two of them seem pretty chummy to her, birds of a feather and all. Daria wrinkles their nose and sticks their tongue out in disgust and says, God no. They clarify that Long just happens to hate them less than he hates Branya and Lanera. Marvis responds, so damn, your only friend is the little wiggler who likes the talking per beast books? That's kinda sad, bro. Lonk defensively insists that he does have friends, they're just not from this group of loser idiot jade bloods he's stuck with. Marvis inquires, oh? Who is it then? And Lonk can only draw a blank. He stands there, his mouth opening and closing a few times, but he conjures no words to answer Marvis's question. Branya nervously offers that she is Lonk's friend. Lonk does not accept this offer. He again goes after Branya, saying that if she were really his friend, she would have... But he trails off. He got dangerously close to revealing something personal, but he brings down the meat cleaver on that train of thought and refuses to let it go anywhere. Marvis digs in a bit deeper. He asks Lonk in his roundabout nonchalant way, would Lonk be leaving behind anything important if he abandoned the caverns? Lonk is silent for a long time. He's balancing on the edge, unable to decide. Branya again tries to extend the olive branch. Lonk rejects it and decisively says to Marvis that he would not be losing anything at all. Marvis twiddles his fingers, thinking for a minute. He then tells Delsa and Joey that Lonk is guilty. The whole car is shocked by this, Lonk especially. He asks Marvis how he's guilty. Marvis chuckles and tells him to simmer down. This isn't actually about the book. Marvis asks for Tarona to bring over the boy band magazine, and she sheepishly obliges. Marvis holds it up, looking back and forth between Actius on the cover and Lonk, and then declares that Tarona was right. Lonk is a dead ringer for Actius. Lonk asks where Marvis is going with this. Marvis explains that, well, as a purple blood, there's much more to his role than making dope as shit music. He's also got to help keep everyone else in line. Tiring and taxing a job though it may be, it also provides him with lots of insider info. And between him and Lonk, and everybody else in the car, he isn't really bothering to whisper. Actius has been getting awfully comfortable lately. Trizza wants him gone, but she doesn't want to lose the massive profits the Empire has been gaining from everything related to Hatch to Dance, nor does she want anyone getting any insurrectionary ideas by culling their favorite pop star. That's where Lonk comes in, says Marvis. You look exactly like him, and a month or two of HRT and you'll sound just like him too. You being a male jade blood is a rare gift, and you should properly utilize it to serve the Empire. You can replace him, and nobody will ever know he got culled. Monk considers this. It's clear the proposition excites him, the glory and fame tantalizing, but he's not stupid either. He asks Marvis what the catch is. Marvis says that Lonk will have to abandon his entire life and identity. He will have to change his name, dress and talk exactly like Actius does, and he can never speak to anybody of this ever again. He will never see the other cloistered jades again either, but he will be rich and famous and have a fabulously easy and cushy life once he is exiled from Alternia. Lonk looks back to the other four. They're all aghast at this offer, each in their own way, unable to find any words to respond to it. Then he looks down at himself and his hands, He's thinking long and hard about this decision. He doesn't want to lose himself. It took a lot of hard work for him to become so confident in who he is, but his bitter, vindictive feelings towards Branya is what tips the scale. Marvis says that, of course, he would have to prove his loyalty to the Empire. He needs to succeed where Actius failed. The caverns are hard to survey because everything goes through the matron's filter. If Lonk knows of any insurrectionary behavior in the caverns, 
He should tell Marvis now. It'll be a lot less painful than if he waits until later, when Teresa's cerulean seers are vetting him. Blanc gulps and looks back at Branya. Again, she flashes him with that uncharacteristically dangerous look. In response, Long sets his jaw and turns back to Marvis. He points at Branya and says, She has been harboring illegal wigglers for almost three sweeps now. Marvis raises his eyebrows, clearly surprised. He didn't think Long would actually offer up anything like that so willingly. Seeing that he is winning Marvis's favor, Long continues. The worst offense of all is on this very train. Carco Piero, the purple blood with painted horns. He should have been dead sweeps ago. And just to throw extra salt in the wound, Long tells Marvis that Branya has been acting as Carico's surrogate Lucis, something incredibly illegal for her to be doing, especially with a troll in a cast so much higher than her own. Marvis chuckles and is like, holy shit, you weren't lying when you said you didn't care about these bitches. Branya is furious. Nobody has ever seen her this angry before. Wanchi, Lanera, and Daria especially all recoil away from her in fear. Branya grabs Lonk by the collar and asks him what the fuck he thinks he's doing. It's one thing to throw Branya under the bus, but Carico hasn't done a single fucking thing wrong. And now, Branya trails off, tears pooling in her furious eyes. He's going to be killed. Are you happy, Lonk? Is this what you wanted? Lonk spits back at her. Maybe now you'll learn your fucking lesson. Branya shakes him by the shoulders like she's shaking a rag doll. What lesson, Lonk? What could anybody possibly have to gain from this? She shouts. Lunk says that he has a lot to gain, actually, and he attends on reaping all of the rewards. Branya has become more despondent and sad and less angry. She begs with Lunk to know why. Why would he do this? Lunk aggressively pushes her hands off his shoulders and says, You threw me away like a used eggshell all those sweeps ago when you picked Lanera over me. I'm just returning the favor. Lunk then smirks evilly at her, clearly enjoying the pain and anguish he has inflicted on Branya. I'll be sure to say hi to Carico for you, he snarls. The player then gets a game over screen, with Marvis leading Lonk out of the car. Ending number three, a one-sided mirror. If Joey shows the snack mix to Daria during the recess, they will snatch it back from her and angrily say not to mess with their shit. Wanshi giggles and says that Daria has been griping about the snack mix being missing since the trial started. Lonk, eavesdropping, leans over and adds that Daria is pretty cranky when they're hungry and mildly inconvenienced. Daria tells him to stuff a strut pod sweater in it. Zephros remarks quietly to Joey that he still can't get over the idea that these trolls all live together in the same hive. It must be so weird. Joey, not taking his hint that he was trying to be quiet, asks the three of them what it's like sharing a room, trying to make idle chat during the recess. All three of them groan collectively. Daria says that Lonk is bad enough, but Lynera is by far the worst blockmate ever. Lonk and Wanchi seem to agree with them on this. Zephro says that Lanera doesn't seem so bad. A little bit strict, but she probably keeps the block really clean. Wanchi exasperatedly exclaims that clean is an understatement. Daria accidentally tracked slime through the hive tunnel once, and Lanera nearly turned them into mother grub feedstock. Lonk adds on, and don't forget Nosy. Good god, if you keep anything in our block, you better be okay with Lanera going through it. She broke one of Wanchi's alarm clocks once and then tried to pretend like it could have been any of us. Lonk rolls his eyes. Once she sadly adds on it was her favorite. It was shaped like a pur beast. I know Daria would never hurt Mr. Whiskers. Joey asks Lonk to back up on that. When there was broken something and then blamed Daria for it before, Daria dryly adds that the sun is bright. Joey asks Daria if they think Lanera could have done it. Daria seems unconvinced. They just say that Lanera usually breaks things on accident, and whoever ripped up the book was really, really pissed off at it. Lonk is looking contemplative. He proposes to Daria and Wanchi what if the three of them teamed up against Lanera to get the blame on her. Daria and Wanchi aren't really on board with this idea. Wanchi is apprehensive because she doesn't want to get Lanera in trouble for something she didn't do. Daria says that it honestly sounds like too much work to be worth it, even if it would be really funny. Wonk presses the two of them a little bit more. Doesn't it suck how much Lanera gets on their asses for, like, no reason? Remember all the mean names she calls the two of you? And the time she took away your soldier Purbeast books for a week because you didn't wash the dishes right, Wanchi? Wanchi and Daria look a little more open to the idea, remembering all the times Lanera's acted tyrannical towards them. Joey asks Wonk, isn't it kind of scummy to conspire behind Lanera's back like this? Wanchi agrees with Joey that it doesn't feel right. Monk narrows his eyes at Joey. He then turns back to his two younger hive mates and promises to take them to the bowling alley in Outglut if they help him. Wanchi is excited by this, but Daria moans that they hate the bowling alley. But Lonk says that's a lie, he knows how much Daria loves to unleash hatred on the pins. 
Daria says if he takes them bowling and gives them his stipend for the next week, they'll help him. Once she follows their lead and insists on the same thing. The two of them smirking mischievously at Lunk. He rolls his eyes but promises he'll take them to the bowling alley without Baranya and Lanera and give them his stipend for the week. Joey is unnerved by how easily Daria and Wanchi were swayed to betray their friend. She asks Daria and Wanchi if it's really worth it to get Lanera in so much trouble. Shouldn't friends forgive each other instead of coming up with petty revenge schemes? Seafrost assures her that it's fine. People betray their friends in Alternia all the time. Usually it ends with one of them dead though, so this is a nice change of pace. Daria says to Joey that Branya lets Lanera get away with a lot. And Lanera's hardly their friend either. She's a nosy bitch who's been on a power trip for sweeps ever since Branya appointed her to second in command. She could do with being knocked down a few pegs. Branya's not harsh on her either. She might be on probation for like a week, but then Branya will forget all about it and everything will be fine. This doesn't comfort Joey. Hurriedly, she asks Tizius to start the trial again, hoping she can get in the way of any conspiring the three Jade Bloods are getting up to. However, once everyone is settled back in, the trial starts back up. Joey is downtrodden when Lonk begins his attack against Lanera. He calls her a nosy bitch and claims to have witnessed her stuffing the book in Daria's locker after she stole the hairpin from Lonk's makeup bag. Daria and Wanchi both agree with this. Daria is a much better actor than Wanchi, but neither of them are very good. Still though, Lonk's using their support for all it's worth. Lonk lets fly a really nasty insult at Lanera. The whole car gasps and Daria puts their hands over Wanchi's ears. Lanera has turned bright green and turns to Branya who is similarly shocked and thrown off by what Lonk said. She shakes herself out of it though and sternly tells the other three to not gang up on Lanera. Daria nonchalantly says it's not ganging up if the three of them saw Lanera committing the crime. Lanera's had it coming for a long time anyways, someone has to humble her. Joey asks Daria where they saw Lanera committing the crime, hoping this will stop them. However, Daria's found their stride now, claiming to have seen Lanera ripping up the book behind a vending machine at the train station. Once she agrees with Daria and hops over to Lanera, lifting up her hand and saying, look, she's got a paper cut from it and everything. Once she is right, there is a paper cut on Lanera's hand, but once she had witnessed her getting this paper cut during a lesson, not from ripping up the book. Before Lanera can respond to them, Stelsa gets in the way, asking Joey why she's questioning Daria when she supposedly believes Daria is innocent. Joey says she's not accusing Daria of anything, she's just trying to get the full story. Lonk says in a calm but threatening tone that this is the full story. Lanera is guilty. Lanera lets out a frustrated noise, pulling at her hair. She yells that she is not guilty of anything. She loves the Jade Blood Code and would never defy it. There is nothing to fault her for here, except for not meeting Long's standards, fucking apparently. Long's facade falls. He laughs and slaps his knee and goes, Yes, that's the reaction I was looking for. Lanera says she expected this kind of underhanded bullshit from Lonk and Daria, but not from Wanchi. Wanchi shrugs and says innocently that Lonk bribed the two of them. Lanera is like, he what? And Wanchi realizes what she just said. In a frenzy, Lanera turns to Long and asks him why on Alternia he would bribe the two younger jades to frame her. Is it because he's really the guilty one? Long is like, what? No, it's because I hate you. This takes Lanera back. She goes green in the face and says, you, you hate me? This cracks Long's facade and he loudly exclaims, no, that's not what he meant and Lanera knows it. Dari and Wanchi both find this exchange incredibly amusing and Branya is rubbing at her temples as if this happens once a week. Embarrassed at her misunderstanding, Lanera crosses her arms defensively and says, well maybe if Lonk talked about his feelings for once, she'd actually understand what the hell he's ever talking about. Lonk spits back that if Lanera wasn't such a socially stunted weirdo, she'd know what he's talking about. The sparks are flying again, and the two of them are giving low warning growls at the other. Joey doesn't want to get in the middle of this fight and signals to Marvis for help, but before Marvis can react, Branya gets between Lonk and Lanera, picking both of them up by the back of their shirts. She shakes them slightly as she exasperatedly demands to know why the two of them can't just get along for one day. Vanya then turns to Wanchi and Daria, who are still sitting on the bench, and you two, she snarls, I've told you a hundred goddamn times not to gang up on Lanera. Lunk repeats what Daria said earlier, insisting that it's not ganging up if they all saw Lanera defacing the book. Branya said she's heard quite enough from Lunk. However, though, she turns to Lanera and asks her why she defaced the book. In disbelief, Lanera sputters, what? You really believe Lunk? Branya inhales sharply and says with a dangerously even tone of voice, if the three of them saw you ripping up the book, there's no point in denying that you did it. Just admit that you were wrong, I won't be angry with you. Lonk is clearly disappointed by the last point. Lanera again asserts that she didn't even touch the book. Frustrated, Branya puts Lonk down and he slumps over onto the bench, rubbing his temples. 
Branya then sets Lenara down and grabs her by the shoulders. Deadly serious, Branya looks Lenara directly in the eyes and asks, Lenara, did you rip up the Rainbow Emotions book? Lenara cracks under Branya's furious amber gaze, bursting into tears and admitting to the crime. Branya sighs with relief and thanks Lenara for being honest. The other three Jadebloods look shocked, not expecting Branya to also blame Lenara for the crime. Marvis, satisfied with his result, asks the court if they have anything else to add. Nobody really has anything to say. Marvis then accepts Lenara as the guilty party. Joey wants to protest, but Zevro stops her, saying it's not worth it to argue with a purple blood once they've got an idea in their head. Marvis stands up to depart. However, to everyone's surprise, he also reaches over and picks up Lenara in the same way that Branya had. He struggles with it a bit more than she did, though. Lenara freezes in fear, and Branya asks Marvis what he's doing. He responds that Lenara is guilty. It's time for a one-way trip to Clown Town. Joey and Tysius both take issue with this, protesting that the entire trial was meant to be an experiment where nobody else gets hurt. Marvis laughs and responds, Don't worry, Lenara won't feel any pain. I promise. Her death will be quick and painless. She should count herself lucky. Lenara's body has seized up with fear. She doesn't want to speak out of line, but she also doesn't want to go with Marvis. Branya tries to come to Lenara's defense and get Marvis to take her instead. However, Marvis refuses, saying that there are no take backsies in Alternian court. Lenara tells Branya to stop. If she is to be taken away in cold today, there is probably a divine reasoning for it. She also tells Branya not to risk her own neck. She has too much valuable knowledge as the matron. She can't step out of line and be cold now. The caverns need her more than they need Lenara. Marvis is like, are you two done yet? Because I'm kind of on a tight schedule here. Branya says that the caverns need Lenara. She needs Lenara. She'd be lost without Lenara's support over all the sweeps. Guilt chews at the edge of Branya's voice as if there's something else she's not saying. Lenara's eyes light up ever so slightly. She asks Branya if she really means it. If Lenara is as special to Branya as Branya is to Lenara. Branya seems like she already knows the answer but doesn't want to say. Instead, she asks Lenara, in what way does she mean special? Lenara flushes green and avoids meeting Branya's eyes. She quietly says, I. I love you, Branya. Branya says that she loves Lenara too. She loves all of her cloistered sisters. But Lenara says, No, not like that. I've loved you ever since the day we met. Branya is quiet and then she admits she knows. It wasn't exactly hard to guess. Lenara is heartbroken. She asks Branya why she didn't say anything then. Why would she let Lenara make a fool of herself all this time? Branya says, I'm sorry, Lenara. I don't feel the same way. Lenara softly says that she always knew that was the truth, but she had someday hoped that Branya would prove her wrong. Branya says to Lenara that it doesn't matter. The two of them can still make the caverns work. Please, Lenara, come back with me. Don't go with Marvis. You have a life to live, a life that will be worthwhile for everything else, if not for the romance. Marvis reminds Branya that Lenara doesn't really have a choice in the matter. However, Lenara says to Marvis that she does have a choice, and she wants to go with him. All of the Jadebloods are shocked by this. Lenara is the most dedicated of all of them. She would never abandon her post. Lonk nervously laughs and says to Lenara, you're not serious, right? You're just joking about you being the culprit. Lenara darkly asks Lonk, is that what my life is to you? A joke? None of them say anything. Lonk, Wanshi, and Daria are all staring uncomfortably at the ground, unable to accept the consequences that their actions have had. Lenara continues, then it's clear she's not welcome in the caverns. Her voice catches as she says, You know, that's all I ever wanted, to feel like I was accepted by the rest of you. But I guess it was foolish to ever want that. Branya again tries one last attempt to tell Lenara that she is welcomed and accepted by the Jades, but Lenara doesn't want to hear any of it. She doesn't want to hear from any of them ever again. She can't bear to think about how much of a fool they've all made of her. Marvis departs the train car, taking Lenara with him. She gives one last tearful glance back at Branya before the door slides shut behind them. Branya's face is in her hands, her shoulders shaking from silent tears. Watching Branya cry, Joey turns to the other three Jadebloods. She asks them if it was worth it. Daria protests that they didn't know Marvis was actually going to take anyone to be cold, but even their conviction sounds weak and they're looking at the floor. A dreadful silence hangs over the car. Wanshi tries to apologize to Branya, but Branya doesn't even acknowledge her presence. The player then gets a game over screen. Ending number four, Trial by Fire. During the recess, Joey can present an article of clothing found in Daria's bag to Lanera. It bears Lonk's symbol. Joey will question why Daria has a shirt with Lonk's symbol on it. Lanera will huff angrily and say it's just another one of the millions of things Branya has let Daria get away with. Joey wants to pursue this a little bit closer, but Lanera is already going off on a tangent. 
Lanera angrily spouts about how much attention Daria gets from Branya. Daria has never done anything to deserve special attention. They're incredibly stubborn, juvenile, and aggravating, and had never shown any kind of respect to Branya. Lanera then states adamantly if she were matron, she would have kicked Daria out sweeps ago for insubordination. A bit into the conversation, Joey cuts Lanera off, and she asks why Lanera has been talking about Daria differently than all the other jades do for the entire trial. Lanera, confused, asks what Joey means. Joey points out that Lanera keeps calling Daria a she. Joey, understandably a bit clueless, says that she didn't know that Daria is a girl. Lanera responds, annoyed, of course Daria is a girl. We all are, except for Lank, of course, but he made that clear enough a long time ago. Joey raises her eyebrow, and Daria didn't? Lanera responds, of course not. Frankly, I think I'd notice if Daria was suddenly a boy. Joey says that the other jades aren't exactly calling Daria a boy either. Lanera adamantly states that if Daria is not a boy, they must be a girl. Joey says, you know, before I came here, I might have been inclined to agree with you. But honestly, at this point, choosing whether to be a boy or a girl seems like it's the least of anybody's worries. Lanera isn't comforted by this. She adamantly states that Daria dresses differently and acts flippant and moody and difficult because they despise Lanera and the Jade Code, and nothing else. Joey offers that maybe Daria acts so flippantly towards Lanera because she keeps denying this part of them. Frustrated, Lanera pulls at her hair. She says, this is all so off topic. Daria is a truant and a degenerate. It doesn't matter what gender they are, there's nothing redeeming about them. Daria, picking at their teeth, interjects moodily that Hey, you know, I can hear everything you're saying about me, Lanera. Lanera is flustered and angry about having been eavesdropped on again. Lanera furiously asks Daria, well, what do you have to say for yourself? Daria snarls that they don't have to explain themselves to Lanera, but Lanera says that, since she is the second in command and ranks above Daria, actually, yes, Daria does have to explain themselves to Lanera. Daria's like, okay then, I'll explain myself. I don't like you. Now can you and the weird lowblood stop fucking talking about me when I am well within earshot of you? Lanera again asserts that as the second in command, it is her right to talk about Daria. Before this spat can escalate, Joey suggests that maybe having the mediation of the trial will help. Daria rolls their eyes and is like, whatever. The trial goes back into session. Lanera is whispering with Stelsa, and Stelsa asks Joey to present evidence against Daria. Joey presents the article of clothing she took from Daria's bag. It is a chest binder with long symbol on it. Stelsa says that the symbol on this article of clothing, as you will notice, does not match the one on Daria's shirt, yet it was found in their bag. Lonk's like, wait, Daria, did you fucking steal that out of the trash? I outgrew that thing like a sweep ago and threw it away. Daria defensively says that if it's in the trash, it doesn't belong to anybody, so it's not stealing. Stelsa then says, so you admit you took it, even if it isn't yours. And again, Daria tries to assert that it was in the trash, it didn't belong to anybody. Delsa ignore this and speaks to Marvis. She says that since the defaced book was found in Daria's locker and Daria admitted to having the book in their bag earlier and knowing that it had been defaced, and we now have evidence that Daria has stolen from their fellow Jade Bloods before, it pretty much proves beyond a doubt that Daria is guilty. Daria angrily throws their hands up and says, Fine, I guess I did do it then, since you all are so hellbent on throwing me under the scuttle bus. Marvis is like, Yo, is that a confession? Because I gotta be taking the guilty party to Clown Town. Daria asks what that means. Marvis responds that Daria will be taken to the Dark Carnival. Daria doesn't quite understand what he means, but Branya stands up and tries to defend Daria. Marvis grabs Daria by the arm, and Branya attempts to warn him, but it's too late and Daria hisses at Marvis, thrashing to throw his grip off. Marvis acts all sad and is like, hey, what the hell, Daria, we're just going to clown town. It doesn't have to be anything painful or a big deal. Branya protests again, telling Marvis to not hurt Daria or to take them away. Daria turns around to face Branya, questioning why she's so suddenly taking an interest in this. After all, she's been pretty damn quiet for the entire trial. Lanera tells Branya not to bother. The caverns will be better off without Daria. Branya is uncomfortable and not meeting Daria's eyes. Branya quietly tells Lanera that she can't keep addressing Daria in the wrong way. It's unfair. Lanera, incredulous, demands to know why Branya wants to reward Daria's bad behavior. Branya says that Daria deserves this basic decency, even if Lanera doesn't like them. Lanera can't believe that Branya is going to continue defending Daria even after they stole and defaced an important religious artifact. Branya quietly confesses that Daria isn't the culprit. They were framed. 
Daria, however, refuses to let Branya continue. They adamantly insist that they were the one who defaced the book. They stole it from Branya's private study and ripped it up because they hate Lanera and Branya and want to make the two of them as miserable as they have made Daria. They stash the defaced book in their locker with the hopes Lanera would find it while snooping around like the insufferable nosy bitch she is. At this point, it's clear that Daria is purposefully trying to be convicted. Lanera is egging Marvis on to take Daria. Branya again tries to save Daria, however, Daria becomes enraged. They snarl at Branya, you never cared about me before. If you let me do one fucking thing in my life, let me do this. Branya tries again to tell Daria that they don't understand what they're getting into, but Daria, no longer fully lucid, retorts that they know exactly what's going to happen in the clown car, and they can't wait for it. Daria turns to Marvis and asks, why wait? do it here, in front of them. If Branya really cares about Daria, it'll hurt her, which is what Daria wants. If she doesn't care, then she'll be happy to see Daria gone, which is what Daria secretly fears is the truth. Marvis is like, eh, I don't want to gunk up the linoleum in here, you know. Shit ain't cheap or easy to find. Lanera tells Daria to stop stalling and acting dramatic and just accept their punishment and go with Marvis. Daria spits back, I bet you'd like that, wouldn't you? Lanera says it'd be nice to see somebody disciplining Daria for once. They're completely out of control. Fury flashes across Daria's face, and something in them snaps, as if Lanera's finally pushed them over the edge. Angrily, Daria lunges at Lanera, teeth and claws bared. They grip Lanera around the neck, shouting angrily, I'll show you out of control. Lonk grabs Wanshi and pulls her away from the fight, and Branya is mortified, frozen to the spot. Lanera lets out a horrible, guttural scream. Daria is choking her, their eyes glossy with rage and contempt. Lanera feels blindly around on her waist. Realizing what is about to happen, Branya yells, Lanera, no! But it's too late. Lanera whips out the knife hidden under her shirt and scores a deep gash into Daria's stomach. Branya pries the two of them apart and they both go clattering to the floor. She takes the knife from Lanera's hand and throws it aside onto the bench and then she runs over to Daria, who is unresponsive. Tears in her eyes, Branya asks Lanera how she could do this. Lanera is incredulous. Daria was trying to kill her. She had no choice. But Branya doesn't respond. She's choking back tears. Lanera looks to Lonk and Wanshi for help. Lonk has let go of Wanshi, who is cautiously approaching Daria's body. She looks down at it, her eyes wide and unbelieving. Wanshi then quietly asks Lanera, They're... they're dead, aren't they? Lanera is unable to meet Wanshi's eyes. She says nothing. Branya has begun sobbing and has thrown her arms around Lonk, who can't bring himself to look at Lanera. Lanera whirls around angrily to Joey and Zephros and blames the two of them. Zephros tries to sputter apologies, but Lanera has gone beyond reason. She reaches for the knife on the bench and the player gets a game over screen. In the background, Marvis can be seen dragging Daria's body away. And that brings us to the true ending. We finally made it. We're not done yet though, so keep holding on. Joey realizes that she had stuffed away Branya's Marvis merch in her hoodie pocket with the intention of stealing it. No reason, she just thinks Marvis is really neat, that's all. is an almost adult who lives on this planet and can buy her own merch. Joey's an alien with no money, it's not gonna hurt anyone. Joey, pulling the tag out of her pocket, presents it to the trial, having an aha moment. The room is silent, but not in the way Joey was hoping. Stelsa tries to have the evidence overturned. However, Zephros points out that Branya is noticeably taken aback by the presentation of this evidence. So Tizius cautiously asks Marvis for permission to continue, which he grants. Stelsa is fuming. Tizius asks Joey to explain her reasoning. Joey remarks that Marvis is not wearing a sign. Marvis shrugs nonchalantly to confirm this. Remember I said he's not wearing his hat? Yeah, I bet you didn't, but he's not wearing his hat. She then holds up the tag, saying that it has a purple sign, which must be Marvis's sign since there is no other troll that Joey knows of who it could belong to, and Branya ripped up the book purposefully to start the trial and get Marvis's attention because she's in love with him. The crowd is unimpressed by this explanation, though Branya's demeanor hasn't changed. It's also objects, saying that who Branya is, as Tagore has informed her bias is, is not relevant information to the trial. Tizius doesn't seem convinced either, but Branya is still antsy, so the pressing continues. In fact, Joey notes that all of the Jade Bloods seem off now that she's presented this evidence, particularly Wanshi, who looks like she's about to explode. Tizius notices this as well and tells Joey to go in for the kill. Joey presses Wanshi on the tag. Wanshi refuses to speak at first, but she cracks under Stelza and Tizius's menacing glares, saying, It's 
But then Lanera slaps her hand over Wanchi's mouth, loudly announcing that the sign belongs to an underground purple blood performer known as Rapsta Slamsey. Shout out to all my friends and homies who remember that one. And Branya is simply embarrassed that her secret love of alternative music is being put on display in front of everyone. Sifro scratches his head, saying that he doesn't recognize the sign. Most purple blood rapper's signs are relatively well known, even Marvis's, despite him not wearing his. Tagora pipes up from the back, announcing that he has done a gorgle search that has proven Raps to Slamsey's sign is not the one depicted on the tag. In fact, according to the Ledger's Lacerator's Imperial Database, which Tarona has so helpfully accessed for him, there is no known purple blood currently living who possesses the sign on Baranya's tag. Stasius and Stelza seem to have completely forgotten the trial at this point, because now the mystery of who the sign belongs to is even more tantalizing than whatever they were arguing about before. Wanchi loudly states that she has to use the bathroom and excuses herself. Stelsa tries to stop her, but Wanchi insists it's an emergency, and Tizius says, Come on, Stelsa, cut her to break, she's like five sweeps old. Wanchi indignantly states that she's five and a half, and then hurriedly exits the scene, slamming the bathroom door behind her. Tizius then asks the audience once again, Does anybody know whose sign this could be? Marvis is like, Oh, are we saying ideas? Because I've had one for like ten minutes now. Tizius, exasperated, is like, yes, we are saying ideas right now. Marvis says, wait here, and then leaves the car, beginning an impromptu second recess. Branya and Lanera are whispering feverently. Lanera will shoo Joey away angrily if you try to approach them. If you approach Monk, he will chuckle a bit and state that this should be interesting. If you approach Daria, they will say, well, at least Lanera is not trying to fillet me anymore, but they will still seem somewhat apprehensive. If you approach Stelsa, she will huffily declare that this is putting them behind schedule and is incredibly far off from what the trial is supposed to be. Tizius assures her, saying that they have several days on this train to figure it out. If you approach Tizius, she will begrudgingly compliment Joey, stating that even if it wasn't what the trial had set out to do, she seemed to uncover some hell of a mystery. Joey must coax Wanchi out of the bathroom. She can hear Wanchi crying, saying that whatever is about to happen is all her fault. Zephyr says some well-meaning but also really sad bullshit like, hey, well, sometimes things are your fault and that's fine. We're all just replaceable cogs in the Alternian war machine anyways. Joey elbows him in the ribs and says to Wanchi that nothing bad is going to happen. It's just a mock trial and the Jade Bloods won't hate her or ostracize her because they're a family and family sticks up for each other. Wanchi asks what family means, and Joey explains it. Wanchi then replies, how are the Jade's family if they aren't blood related? Joey responds that family takes a lot of forms, but the bond of blood is not what ties families together, but the bond of trust. She says that the Jade Bloods remind her of herself and her brother and her babysitter. Neither of them are what most people would call a family. Both groups are dysfunctional, flawed, and don't always get along the best, but they care for each other, and that's what matters the most. Wanchi will then come out of the bathroom, teary-eyed and still sniffling. Joey and Zephyrus will lead her back over to the Jade Bloods. Wanchi tells Branya and Lanera that she's sorry for ruining everything. Lanera tells Wanchi that it's not her fault, and that as her mentor and teacher, it should have been Lanera's job to look out for Wanchi. Lanera should have come to Wanchi's defense when she was being unfairly singled out, but instead she was too blinded by contempt for Daria to do her job properly. She then apologizes to Wanchi and the two embrace. Branya is about to reconcile with Wanchi when the door of the car is flung open, ending the second recess. Marvis enters the train car and steps aside, revealing a very small clown behind him. It's Carico. The teals all look puzzled, but the Jade Bloods are completely mortified, especially Branya. Sifro says that the fear of clowns is well-founded, but he can't imagine why they're so much more rattled by this tiny wiggler than they are by Marvis. Marvis takes his seat back between the Jades and the Teals, but Carico is still standing in the doorway. Everyone in the car is watching him silently, and you could hear a pin drop. Branya appears to be silently praying. The silence is finally broken by Carico letting out a loud but excited honk and running across the car, jumping right into Branya's lap and hugging her. This visibly threatens her resolve, but she still does not acknowledge his presence. To Joey and Zephyrus' surprise, none of the Jades are shocked by this. They merely look resigned. The Teals, however, are completely aghast and floored by what has just happened. Stelsa demands to know who this troll is, but it's clear that the interest is far deeper than it ever was in the trial. Branya is refusing to answer, still acting like Carico isn't there. To move things along, Stelsa asks Joey to present the necklace again. She then summons Carico, who is happy to oblige, and, unaware of the tense situation, meanders over to Stelsa, and she compares the necklace he has on to the one Joey was presenting. They have the same sign, the only difference is that Carico is currently wearing one that does not have the return to Branya or Sama message engraved on the back. Again, Joey asks Branya to explain. 
Perico is clamoring to get back into Branya's lap. She finally acknowledges his existence and lifts him up, and then she takes a deep breath. She explains Carico to the court, how she had faked his death when he was a wiggler, and she had been raising him in secret for the last almost three sweeps. She then says that she had switched the two tags and instructed Carico to pretend like he didn't know her as to not arouse suspicion from the purple bloods on the train car. She then shakily but defiantly states that she would do anything to protect Carico, just as she would for any of her jades. Tizius is like, alright, well that's certainly a mystery that nobody even knew was a mystery, but damn if it didn't just get solved. It's a reference to Dave's line from Homestuck Proper. Joey says, wait, Branya said that Carico had been with her up until they boarded the train. We know from Daria that the book was defaced while they were still at the train station. Zephyrus catches onto Joey's drift, stating that this makes Carico an unaccounted for witness. Tizius beams with pride at both of them for how quickly they picked up this detective slash lawyer thing. Joey says, okay, but there's one problem. How do we question him if he can't talk? Branya puts Carico aside and stands up, saying that won't be necessary. Branya confesses to the crime. She admits that she had found the book in one of her jade's backpacks. She will not give away who brought it on the train. Branya says that the book had been causing headaches in the caverns for so long, filling the jade's head with lies and blasphemy. She had been planning to do away with it for what felt like an eternity, but could never find a moment where Lanera wasn't trailing her like a lost puppy. When she found the book, Lanera was firmly assigned to be Long's accountability buddy, and Branya knew that Lanera would never disobey Branya's direct order for the two to stay together, and she took her chance to destroy the book. Lanera is shocked and refuses to believe that Branya could be a codebreaker like this. She adamantly insists that the book was found with Daria's stuff, and Daria had admitted to having the book in their backpack and being aware of it having been defaced, so it had to be Daria. Lonk laughs and tells Lanera that there's a lot she doesn't know about Branya, which is funny considering how much time Lanera spends with her snout up Branya's nook. Lanera bright green, again, is in denial, insisting that it must be Daria. Daria bristles angrily, retorting that they had also said that they don't know what the hell the book even is. Branya tells them to calm down. She says that she had put the book in Daria's backpack because she knows Lanera goes through her stuff. Lanera sputters indignantly, but can't deny this fact, and Daria's backpack is full of trash, so she figured they wouldn't even notice the book, and Branya could retrieve it when she got back to the caverns. Daria gets pissed, telling Branya, well, what the hell, you are fine with letting me take the fall for it? You waited until now to say anything? Branya tells Daria that there's no reason to get upset. It's just a mock trial. Nobody is going to get in trouble. Before Daria can respond, Marvis's chuckling interrupts. The two snap around to face him. Marvis says, now, hold on a minute. This isn't exactly a mock trial. All of their grievances might be over fake bullshit, but he had spent real and valuable time on it. He was acting as the judge, and like the messiahs, he needed something in return. Branya cautiously asks what he means. Marvis says, well, we were here to find the guilty party, and we found you. I'd call this a done deal. You're coming with me to the clown car. Joey and Tizius both protest. That was never the deal. Nobody was supposed to get hurt. It was just an experiment. Marvis is wholly unconvinced and adamantly states that the Dark Carnival has an admission price. He grabs Branya by the arm to start dragging her away. She angrily shakes his grip off and there's a deadly silence in the car once again. Joey remarks to herself that she's starting to get tired of earth-shattering silence. Marvis again tells Branya that she has to come with him. Branya's breathing quickens and she defiantly states that she won't be abandoning her jades. Marvis says that she doesn't have a choice. The messiahs have a plan for her. He isn't exactly taking her seriously, but he does seem mildly irritated. Branya challenges Marvis to a strife, stating that if she wins, Marvis will go back to the clown car and not bother them again. If Marvis wins, Branya will surrender and accept her fate without protest. Marvis laughs and then accepts. Darkly, he says that the messiahs eagerly await him, putting Branya in her place. This situation triggers a Strife minigame. The Strife minigame has two possible endings. The player will temporarily be able to control Branya as well as Joey and Zephros to Strife against Marvis. The first part of the minigame is quite easy and much less about playing and more about character dialogue as Branya talks to her jades while dodging Marvis's blows. Branya tells Daria that she is sorry for being dishonest. Daria merely crosses their arms and scoffs and says that Branya's actions speak louder than her words. If Branya had been lying about this when she didn't even think it was important, what else does Branya lie about? Her name? Her status? Whether or not she even loves Daria at all? Daria says Branya has told them I love you so much, but from the way Branya acts, those words never felt true, not once to Daria in their entire life, and especially not now. Lanera wants to defend Branya, but Branya cuts her off. She says that she doesn't want Lanera fighting her battles for her. 
Branya asks Daria why they would ever believe that Branya doesn't love them. Daria is about to respond when Marvis gets a good hit in on Branya. She's reeling backwards, and if the player doesn't do something quick, he might finish her off right here. If the player is not able to figure out the correct combination of items in time, Marvis will move in for the kill. He unsheaths the sword in his staff and slashes a deep blow into Branya's midsection. Branya coughs and hacks, falling down and spitting out blood. Marvis sheaths his sword, saying, Well, that was easy. Branya sits up and Lanera rushes over to her, looking at the gash in her abdomen. Lanera says, tears in her eyes, that this is likely a fatal injury. Branya asks Marvis if she's allowed to say goodbye to her jades before being taken away. Marvis allows her this, return to his chill and somewhat silly disposition. All of the jade bloods gather around Branya. Branya says that she knew she'd have to say goodbye to them someday, but she never pictured it being like this. She is rapidly growing weaker. As Branya dies, she tells each jade how much she loves them. She tells Wanchi how incredible and talented she is at creating, and how inspiring her genuine optimism is, and how her love of learning has always brightened Branya's day. She tells Daria that their tenacity and independence is something Branya wishes she could have kept her whole life, and the fact that they have kept going for this long always made Branya feel like she could overcome anything. She tells Lonk that his confidence in himself and his choices always helped her feel better about herself and how she's been leading the Jade Bloods. She tells Lanera that she couldn't have asked for a better second-in-command and best friend. She loves all of them so much. And lastly, Branya tells Karako that she is going away and she won't be coming back. He doesn't seem to understand. He is so young, after all. Branya tells him to be good and to listen to Lanera. Marvis then begins hauling Branya off to the clown car. As the two exit, Branya turns around and says to Lanera, Take care of them for me, Lanera. I know that you're going to be a great matron. Lanera breaks down into tears, and the player gets a game over screen. And last but not least, we have the true good ending. Marvis gets a good hit on Branya. She's reeling backwards, and if the player doesn't do something quick, he might finish her off right there. If the player asks for a hint, Tizius will note that for the whole fight, Marvis has been keeping Branya at a distance with his staff. She concludes that he must realize Branya is stronger than him, and if they can get Branya in grappling range, she might be able to beat him. The player must figure out the combo in time. If Joey blinds him with the flashlight and then Zephyrus levitates Karako's tag at Marvis, Marvis will be stunned by the flashlight and cover his eyes. Karako will then pounce on Marvis, honking happily and causing him to stumble back. Branya goes in for a grapple, wrestling the staff out of Marvis's hands and pinning him down under her knee like she does with rampaging Lucy. With all her weight onto him, Marvis is firmly trapped. Marvis taps out of the fight. Branya backs up off of him, allowing him to stand up. The two of them are good and ruffled up, but it's nothing they won't recover from. Marvis dusts his suit off and tells Branya that she fought well, and he'll be departing now. However, Marvis darkly promises that she hasn't seen the last of him. Lanera rushes over to Branya and starts looking at her scrapes and bruises as soon as Marvis is out of the car. Lanera walks Branya back over to the seats, and Branya is limping slightly. Kariko hugs her, making her wince. Once she is like, wow, Branya, that was incredible. How did you do it? Branya said that it was the same as what motivated her to do anything else, her jades. Lonk rolls his eyes and says, don't make me vomit. Wanchi says, aw, oh, come on, Lonk. You know Branya loves us, right? She would never let anything bad happen to any of us. Lonk is like, shh, whatever. Then he changes the subject and is like, hey, Wanchi, you brought the newest Soldier Purbeast book, right? No reason why, just curious, and the two of them exit the scene. Once the two of them are talking amongst themselves feverly, Branya turns to Daria. Daria crosses their arms defensively and tries to pretend like they can't see Branya. Lanera is tending to Branya's wounds and objects when Branya shoos her away, but eventually obliges when Branya is more firm about it. Branya says, Daria, do you really feel like I don't love you? And Daria responds, How else am I supposed to feel? You never let me do anything fun. I have to always be working or locked up in the hive. You only praise me when I do my duties exactly like how you want them to be done. You and Lanera both always lecture me about what I'm doing wrong, chiding me for how I look or how I act. I'm not allowed to express myself except for in ways that you approve of. You don't care about how I feel or if anything bad happens to me. If you love me, it's the perfect version of me in your head that you love, not the real me. Branya is silent for a long time, staring deeply at Daria. She then says, Daria, I had no idea you felt like this. Why didn't you tell me? Daria bristles, spitting that trust is a two-way street. Branya never trusted Daria enough to tell them anything important. As far as Daria knew, Branya didn't even care. Why should they have bothered? 
Bronya says that she never intended for Daria to find the book in their bag. She assumed there was so much garbage in Daria's backpack, they wouldn't even notice it. Daria says, but you know I hate when you mess with my stuff. I tell you all the time, fuck off and stop nannying me and you never listen. Branya says, that's a rude word, young lady. And Daria snaps, cut it out with the young lady bullshit. I hate it and I'm not a wiggler like Wanshi either. Branya says, do you always have to be so difficult? Daria responds, you made my whole life difficult. I think it's a fair trade. Branya inhales, centering herself again. She then says, Daria, I am sorry for getting angry with you. It wasn't fair of me, especially after all I put you through today. If I had known all this would have happened, I would have just left the book in Wanshi's bag where I found it. Daria's like, huh? Wanshi brought the book on the train? And Branya face palms, saying, shit, I promised I wouldn't tell anyone. And Daria smiles wryly, saying, well, do I look like a fucking drone to you? Branya ruffles their hair, and they stiffen up and give a warning hiss. Branya pulls her hand away, saying sorry, and Daria's like, hey, you actually listened to me this time. Branya says, of course I listened. I love you, Daria. I always have, and I always will, with all of my pusher. Can I give you a hug? Daria says no, but then adds on, maybe someday, when they're ready for it. Branya says that that's more than she could have ever hoped for. She then nods to Lanera, who comes back and continues fussing over Branya's scrapes and bruises. Branya says to Lanera, I think you also got something to say to Daria. Daria is considerably less open towards Lanera, but still listens. Lanera looks between Daria and Branya, trying to connect the dots until she exhales. Lanera says, Daria, I am sorry for immediately suspecting you. I know that we do not always see eye to eye, but as juvenile and irritating as you are, I know that Branya is a good judge of character. She tells me that you are tenacious, and I was persecuting you so harshly tonight. I did not want to believe that Branya could have done such a thing. I always get angry with Long for singling me out, but now I realize that I have been doing the same to you. I need to be more open-minded and accepting of who you are, even if you are different from me. I'm sorry, Daria. There is a silence. Lanera then blurts out incredulously, well, what do you have to say? Daria's got a smug grin and is like, oh sorry, I was just reveling in this rare moment of you having to eat your words. Branya gives Daria a stern look, and Daria continues, I know I'm kind of a pain in the ass to you sometimes. I guess if I were you, I would have suspected me as well. But I promise, I have no interest in even reading any of the incredibly boring books in our library, let alone stealing or defacing them. Lanera hotly says that they're not boring and you should be reading them, they're integral to our mission and... Lanera trails off, realizing she's missing the point. She then says that she appreciates Daria's reassurance and will try to be more open-minded in the future. The camera pans away and the jades go out of focus. Joey and Zephros are back in the foreground. Joey is like, man, I'm glad that's over. Zephros is like, yeah, that was crazy. I've never seen anyone stand up to a purple blood like that. Joey says it was amazing how much Branya cares about her jades. They bickered a lot and had so many problems, but in the end, she was willing to lay down everything to protect them. Zephros says, yeah, weird. Joey is like, no, Zephros, it's not weird. Zephros is like, but whenever I was in over my head, Damik would just peace out and leave me behind. And Joey's like, yeah, when you really care about someone, you'll do anything to keep them safe. Don't you feel that way about Damik? And Zephros says, yeah, of course. And then Joey responds, does he do the same for you? And Zephros was like, hmm. I don't want to think about that or confront any of my complex feelings right now. Joey is frustrated at his denial, but acknowledges that it's progress. He's not all the way there yet, but maybe she'll get him there someday. He didn't just blindly defend Damik this time, he just needs a little more of a push. She then says, well, thankfully, neither of us will ever have to be in Branya's position. That would just be awful and scary. Ominous foreshadowing for what happens later in the game. They then continue into the blue car, which is basically the same, and okay, yeah, I'm done here. I think I've talked long enough. Oh my gosh, I finally made it to the end. And I know that was a lot and a very long video. At the time of writing this portion of the script, I haven't even fully outlined everything, but the document's already 22 pages long. And note from post-writing script Dia, the script ended up being 44 pages long. I want to give my sincere thanks to anybody who listened for this long. I really love character building and hive swap and writing stories, so all of this was a ton of fun to work on. I've never really done narration before, so hopefully it wasn't too terrible to listen to. 
I wanted each of the endings to match the characters they were focused on, and to feel like they were tackling a different and distinct interpersonal conflict between the Jade Bloods. I really wish I could have included the Teal Bloods more. If this was the actual game that you were playing, I think they would have a lot more dialogue and little moments scattered throughout, but this whole thing was getting so long that I had to cut a lot of stuff that wasn't integral to the story just to keep this video from being like three hours long. Which meant skimping on the Teal Blood interactions, unfortunately. Though I really have no real problems with how the Teal Bloods were portrayed in Act 2, so I guess it's a if it's not broken, don't fix it situation. Daria and Wanshi were the easiest characters for me to write because they're the easiest for me to relate to, but the most challenging part was Lanera. Not necessarily figuring out her personality, but rather realistically portraying her accidental prejudices so she has room to learn and grow, but not pushing her beyond redemption. She's a very stubborn person who finds a lot of comfort from order, organization, and predictability. I didn't want to make her come off as a bad person, but rather a person who can overcome some of her own flaws by learning to be more accepting of those around her. She's insecure, and she takes out her insecurities and frustrations on others without even realizing that she's being harmful. She has empathy problems and struggles with understanding why other people feel things or behave differently than how she does. I also want to address that Lanera's behavior was tagged as child abuse, ableism, and transphobia in this story. I want to clarify that I don't believe Lanera in this incarnation is a transphobe, an ableist person, or a child abuser. If making Lanera maliciously bigoted had been my intention, I would not have made her a sympathetic character. I added the content warnings because some of her behavior may be reminiscent of how transphobes, ableists, or child abusers may act in real life, and I wanted to give people the opportunity to avoid that if they wish. I'm really hoping that my intention for Lanera to be a sympathetic character came across appropriately in this portrayal. I always imagined that, prior to this story, Daria had never talked to Lanera about being non-binary, and since Daria wasn't trans in a super obvious, impossible to miss way like Lang, Lanera didn't fully know about or understand this part of Daria. This is a common struggle for a lot of non-binary people, myself included, to have those close to them not get what it means to be non-binary. I wanted to write this conflict in such a way that it feels realistic, and although Lanera does have a harmful misunderstanding, show that she isn't a malicious person and when given the opportunity to grow, she will take it. This also applies to her conflict with Wanchi, albeit over a different topic. I was really sad when Lanera and Wanchi's relationship as a guardian and ward was seemingly removed in Act 2 because I just think their dynamic has a lot of potential and it always gets me right in the heartstrings to think about Wanchi being a little kid struggling with a learning disability and getting the proper accommodations for it. Lang was also a bit tricky because many of the deeper aspects of his characterization had to be completely fabricated from my brain. I didn't want to declaw him or make him simply tragic and misunderstood. I wanted him to be a pretty insufferable dude who does a lot of nasty, awful shit, but I also wanted there to be deeper reasons for why he's become such an awful person that make you find him interesting as a character. I also wanted his relationship with Lanera to feel more salvageable, as in I don't feel right writing these characters as reconciling when one of them is borderline sexually harassing the other one. Long still holds massive contempt for Lanera, and he does say and do things that are unforgivable and awful, but there's a reason for it now, and if he ever crosses the line into unacceptable behavior, he's actually punished for it. He sold his friends up the river, but he's going to lose his entire identity. He's a bitter person who is motivated more by his contempt than his love of anything, and that's his fatal flaw. I know I left his backstory a bit vague here, but I'm also working on a long friend sim route redo that'll go more in-depth to his history with Lanera and Branya, so I won't spoil all of it here, but if you're interested, keep an eye out for that. And finally, Branya. There is a lot I could say about her. She's most interesting to me when she has a level of moral bankruptcy to her. She's been on top a long time, and I like to think that she burdens herself with all the hardest, most emotionally taxing jobs like selecting Wigglers and Lucy for culling, so her other jades don't have to deal with the inevitable psychological trauma that comes with having to choose which babies have to die. She's good at hiding everything she feels, and she's desensitized to a ton of really messed up things, and she's not above doing underhanded shit to keep her jades in line. I was really excited when playing the original and the papers were in Branya's locker. I thought she was the real culprit, and it made the most sense to me. That's why I changed it to be her. It felt most fitting with my versions of the characters, and none of the other jades except for Lonk would suspect her. 
There were a lot of moving parts to this project, like drawing, writing, video editing, brainstorming, recording, so it always felt like I was doing something new and exciting. Overall, I really hope that I didn't do too badly for my first time making a video. I want to give a special thanks to my friend Jeb, who was a godsend during this project. They really helped me flesh out some of these characters' relationships, which I think brought more life to the story. They also gave me a lot of really good feedback on my drafts that kept me motivated to finish this project. Their URL is on the screen now, you should really check out their art if you're into Homestuck and Hive Swap. It's really great. Another big inspiration for this video was Tinel Flowers' Let's Rewrite the Power of Three. I haven't read past Arc 1 of Warriors, but the structuring of their video really helped me figure out exactly how I should go about making this one, and what order everything should go in and whatnot. Even if you haven't read Warriors, I highly recommend watching their video if you haven't already. It's an excellent watch and has a lot of great character writing. And with all that said, this is where I'm going to end the video. I've talked long enough already. Hopefully you like my take on the Jade Teal car of Hive Swap Act 2. What did you think? Let me know in the comments below, because the YouTube algorithm likes comments and I'm a new channel, so yeah. I guess that's my generic like, comment, and subscribe outro. Uh, I didn't script this part, but thank you everyone for watching. I will see you in the next video. Bye!